All right. Well, very good morning to everybody. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Warm welcome to our sixth annual Women in Medicine and Science Professional Development Conference brought to you by SIU Medicine's Alliance for Women in Medicine and Science, or AWIMS, which is housed in the SIU Medicine's Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. My name is Dr. Vidya Prakash. I am the Chief Medical Officer and Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs and Population Health at SIU Medicine and the Director of AWIMS. Our conference theme over the next few days is creating inclusive environments. And what I'd like for you to do is I would like for you to take, take a step back and think about the last time you looked, and I mean really observed, your environment, whether it was the pictures on the walls, um, artwork, even statues that were showcased in your clinical space, when you moved into your office space, the halls connecting the buildings, meeting areas and lecture halls, and ask yourself, do I really belong here? Is this environment welcoming for a person like me? Is this the sort of place where I will thrive because of my unique background and talent? Well, we are incredibly fortunate to have four exceptional, renowned, and knowledgeable speakers to get to the heart of these questions and why they are so important in ensuring equity in the workplace. This morning, you'll be hearing from Dr. Pamela Chen on medical portraiture. You'll be hearing from Dr. Bonnie Mason on equity in graduate medical education. And you'll be hearing from Dr. Padmini Murthy and Dr. Catherine Sharkey on national and global efforts to foster equity, diversity, and inclusion. You'll also be getting a flavor of what we're doing here in our organization with regards to women on the walls and our project on inclusion and belonging at the organizational level. You'll be hearing a wonderful, uh, impactful story slam, which celebrates the experiences and wisdom of international medical graduates. And we're gonna hear from our future, our own SIU School of Medicine's Marginalized Students Network between the Asian Pacific, American Medical, Asian Pacific American Medical Students Association, the Latino Medical Students Association, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, and the American Medical Women's Association branch at SIU Medicine. I would like to give a special nod to the Dream Team, also known as our Conference Planning Committee, Dr. Wendy Elamine, Dr. Susan Hingle, Dr. Stacy Satovia, Ms. Laura Worrell, Dr. Vidya Sundaration, and Dr. Hyung Han. It's incredible that we're at our sixth annual conference. I still have to do a double take um, every time I say that because I can't believe we've come this far. And I feel this conference gets stronger and stronger every year, and it's thanks to this brain trust that you see before you. So much gratitude to the talent um, and the creativity and the genius of this team. I'd also like to thank our Office of Continuing Professional Development uh, colleagues and our information technology colleagues who made this conference possible. And we would be nowhere without our sponsors. The organizations and departments that you see on these, this screen have sponsored us year after year after year because they clearly see the value of our organization. Memorial Health System, the SIU Center for Human and Organizational Potential, Departments of Internal Medicine, Surgery, Neuroscience Institute, Department of Family and Community Medicine, Emergency Medicine, Medical Education, Pediatrics, the Simmons Cancer Institute, and the Department of Population Science and Policy. My heartfelt thanks to each one of these tremendous organizations who keep us going. So a little bit about the Alliance for Women in Medicine and Science. And you see um, some of the recognition that we've had um, from being featured as an inspiring affinity group in the Insight into Diversity magazine in 2020, to a nod from the National Institute, um, Institutes of Health, Office of Research on Women's Health, um, through an honorable mention for their prize for enhancing faculty gender diversity. So what is AWIMS? Our vision is equity and justice for women in medicine and science, and our mission is a strong and meaningful alliance, meaning that it's not just for the women, it's not just for the physicians, it takes an entire community to move the gender equity needle. <clears throat> and we're focused on gender equity and 
the championing of women in medicine and science in SIU and the communities we serve. We have five uh, arms. The first is education, led by Dr. Robert Robinson and Dr. Aisha Rafaquat. We do quarterly in-person and virtual sessions on panel discussions typically covering topics from gender equity to work-life integration to sexual harassment. Dr. Robinson is spearheading our own he for she arm, um, really mobilizing um, the entire community uh, in the spirit of allyship to move the gender equity needle. And he is doing a lot of impressive work in research where we're doing a deep dive into our own processes and looking at letters of evaluation and making sure that our faculty have awareness on gender bias and racial bias in writing letters of recommendation and evaluations. So a lot of great work in this sphere. Research. AWIMS was awarded the American Medical Association's Joan F. Giambalvo Fund for the Advancement of Women a couple of years ago. And with that, we started the RiseWins program, research initiative to sponsor and empower women in medicine and science, where we pair junior faculty who don't have a lot of experience with research with senior research faculty. And it was so empowering to see women faculty who had no experience in research now presenting at national meetings and even publishing. And we're on year two of this and very excited about it. We also have a monthly journal club um, where we have very robust discussions on gender equity, intersectionality, and racial and gender bias. And many thanks to our co-chairs, Dr. Akshay Kohli, Dr. Shruti Hegde, Dr. Hyang Han, and Dr. Georgia Lucky. When you look at community engagement, we're very involved in our community, thanks to our co-chairs, Dr. Erica um, Austin and Mr. Stephen Newman. We provide meals for our um, community uh, members who are homeless. We are contributors to Habitat for Humanity. We organize food and clothing drives. And we have a Colors of Health fashion show program that's coming up in June where all proceeds will go to um, a very deserving community organization. Mentorship and career advancement led by Dr. Crowdy Shohan and Dr. Andrew Wilbur. We have a centralized hub of a list of mentors where anybody in the organization can access that list and reach out to those mentors. And we've had mentorship sessions where in speed dating style, we have mentors sitting at tables and rotating mentees in 10 to 15 minute intervals to match up with the right mentor. So a lot of great work in this realm. Mindfulness and wellness led by Dr. Alex Hopkins and Ms. Jessica Durhecki. You see in the bottom right corner, that is our wellness room. And this is a place where anyone in the organization from students to faculty can come in, unwind, they can do yoga, they can rest, they can study, it's a safe space. And we do a lot of sessions, both on-site and off-site retreats on matters related to wellness. And what I'm very proud of is that we're not as AWIMS afraid to tackle the bigger issues. Dr. Alex Hopkins recently led a very impactful session on a discussion on abortion um, and where we stand as healthcare providers um, you know, on, on abortion. And it was a very impactful, enlightening, and powerful session. This is pre-pandemic, our professional development conference several years ago. Um, you know, captured in this slide is all of the fun that we continue to have in the virtual forum. We've had several, uh, you know, two other very successful professional development conferences that have been virtual. Um, and it's been a joy to be a part of this. I'm very proud of our AWIMS Executive Leadership Program. Um, our graduates just finished their one-year program. It was a year-long intensive look into matters related to strategic career planning, negotiation, um, and wellness. And we even had a three-day adaptive leadership retreat. And so this went really well. I'm so proud of our graduates and we're really excited to keep this program going. We have a quarterly newsletter. Um, we feature things from the inaugural Kinnebrew, Kinnebrew Conference. We tackle gun violence, detoxifying medicine. We feature our own internal programs like community health workers, and we feature interesting articles. So this is a great way to keep our community engaged and apprised of all that we're doing. And again, a part of greater dialogue on important matters. 
I'm really proud of our internal and external partnerships and collaborations. Um, the Departments of Internal Medicine and Medical Humanities, we've done a lot of work with both of them, our Center for Human and Organizational Potential, and our Marginalized Student Network. And externally, I'm very proud of our partnerships with OWIMS from Brown University, CWIMS from University of Minnesota. We actively contribute to the WIMS Summit um, and are very involved with the American Medical Women's Association. Promotion and tenure. This is work that I'm very proud of as well. This was a collaborative where we looked at our data, saw disparities um, among the genders, and approached our department chairs and offered support. And as a result of our efforts, if you look at total promotions, purple being women um, and black being men, you know, both are actually on a very positive trajectory. And it's nice to see that the women who started at somewhat of a low point are steadily making their way up. Um, and so we're closing that gap. And we have a new record. 2023 marks the highest number of women promoted to the rank of professor in the history of the School of Medicine. So a lot of great work here. My heartfelt gratitude to my executive committee and to the people you see here, our advisory board. These are stakeholders from across the organization who provide their insight um, into keeping AWIMS going and as strong as it is. And so without further ado, I do want to introduce Dr. Chen, but before we do, we have a very special guest, one of my favorite he for she allies, our Dean, Dr. Jerry Cruz. What I, what, what I love about Dr. Cruz is that he is so beyond lip service. He embodies allyship. So if there's any he for she, in the audience, if you want to know what he for she looks like, you see him right here. This is Dr. Cruz. He has been the greatest champion of AWIMS. He is so excited about our work. He's the one doing cartwheels when he hears that we have six women um, promoted to professor. And he's the reason I met SIU, one of the big reasons. I know I'm in the right place because this is the type of leader that we need. Dr. Cruz. Oh. Thanks so much, Dr. Prakash. Uh, obviously, it's a pleasure working with this organization. Uh, the five conferences have been great. Great, The day-to-day -day work that's been done is uh, fantastic. And there is no doubt that, uh, that what you do every day and what you do more broadly has changed the culture at the SIU School of Medicine. No doubt. Uh, you know, I appreciate everything that affects uh, the lives and the attitudes of individuals and groups here. Uh, I also really appreciate uh, bringing in uh, experts from away, from outside, as you as you have today, the four that will lend expertise and will will make us better, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, I'm also very happy to see the recognition that you've gotten nationally because it's now it's now more important than ever for organizations like AWIMS and schools of medicine like the SIU School of Medicine to take a, a bigger national voice I, because for the first time we're seeing more organized pushback against, against the type of work that we're doing nationally. So speaking like a dean, I'm gonna you know, try to just say a few words about the bigger picture here and some things that have just you know, hit me lately. So. Amer the American public is weaponized to the hilt. So books are being taken away from elementary and high school teachers and their students. Reproductive rights for women are being attacked across the nation and are in immediate peril in more than half the states. And just uh, last week, I, w I got, uh, got an email and it listed three bills <clears throat> that were uh, just about to be passed in the Florida legislature. Let's see, those are bills 444, 750, and 266. I thought it was a joke at first when I first read them, but no, it's true. These have passed both the House and the Senate in Florida in different versions, and they're in conference committees now. They're, they're, they'll soon be ready to go to the governor and they'll be signed into law there. So just, just listen, I'll, I'll give a little summary of each one. Senate Bill 444, district school board elections, allows candidates running for school board to live outside the school districts and move only if elected. So 
This allows uh, the election of hand-picked ideologues. 750 elections, the voter suppression bill of Florida, creates critically excessive barriers for several large segments of eligible voters to exercise their rights, including the elderly, the infirm, low-income working families, and underserved populations. And Senate Bill 266, higher education, bans Florida colleges and universities from having majors or minors in women's and gender studies, or a derivative from the belief system of critical race theory, and forbids colleges and universities, forbids colleges and universities from spending money on any program or activity that espouses diversity, equity, and inclusion. So gender equity, there's a pushback. There's a pushback against equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, justice, fairness, you know, across the board right now. So the national voice is clearly important. And what is done locally, the great work that is done here will be a shining light for the rest, rest of the nation. Thank you for all you do. And I look forward to the continuing work of this group and uh, I'll, I'll help in any way I can. So the, the conference looks great. The speakers look great. The topics do too. So uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz. And again, many thanks to you for your support and many thanks to our Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Wendy el for her leadership and support. You know, again, with the both of you at the helm, I, I feel like we have hope. I really do. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I am really, really excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Pamela Chen. Dr. Chen grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, graduated from Harvard Medical School in 2020, and is currently a third year pediatrics resident in the Boston Combined Residency Program at Boston Children's Hospital and Boston Medical Center. Next year, she will be a chief resident at Boston Medical Center, after which she plans to pursue pediatric gastroenterology and a career in, under, in undergraduate medical education. She continues to use her lifelong passion for the arts as one of several tools to advance community building, equity, and advocacy. And so Dr. Chen is going to talk, to, talk about the art of inclusion, medical portraiture, history, and legacy. Dr. Chen, it's an honor. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to learning from you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm just going to go ahead and um, share my slides. All right. Um, all right. So as, as you all heard, I'm Pamela. I'm currently a third year pediatrics resident at Boston Children's Hospital and Boston Medical Center. Um, I'm so honored to have been invited to speak for you all today and to kick off what sounds like will be a truly fantastic and thought provoking conference. Um, as Dean Cruz was just outlining, um, and I'm, as I'm sure you all are deeply aware, our rapidly changing political landscape continues to make it even more essential for us in the medical community to advocate for equity across multiple domains. Um, so today is just one piece of that. Um, I'll be sharing my journey during medical school, getting to interview and paint some incredible Harvard Medical School alumni. Uh, this was a portrait gallery project that I originally entitled the women before me dedicated to the women after. Through this journey, I learned so much about myself, my own alma mater, um, and the unique power of portraiture in highlighting the previously unseen. So today I'll be focusing on how art can serve as one out of many tools that we can use for advocacy. And I hope to inspire you all to join me in this work in creating inclusive environments. And it seems like you guys already have that agenda outlined um, in a wonderful, wonderful way. In terms of learning objectives, um, by the end of this talk, participants should be able to, one, describe how the visual environment can contribute to unspoken feelings of alienation or affirmation. Two, Recognize how art sends a message about relative worth and importance. And three, 
implement strategies to make the physical spaces of medical schools and hospitals align with a mission of inclusivity and equity. So these are two pictures of my entering medical school classes orientation in the amphitheater of Brigham and Women's Hospital back in 2016. I invite you to reflect over the course of your medical training, have you ever sat in a room where the walls look like this? I think it's telling that when I've shared these photos in the past, many have mistakenly identified these photos as taken from lecture halls from all across the country. And you can only see one wall in this photo and only a handful of the dozens of portraits previously in this room, but the visual effect of seeing so many larger than life portraits of solely white men is already striking. The only woman captured visually on the walls I acutely noticed during my orientation was actually within a tiny recreation of a family photo on a department chair's desk. After this orientation experience, I became keenly aware of how the portraits on our campus and in our hospitals, which almost universally featured white men, differed from the changing demographic composition of my classmates. Indeed, the AAMC reports that women have officially comprised the majority of entering medical students since 2017, so right around this time. And for my alma mater specifically, over half of my classmates were women and about half were either Asian or underrepresented minorities. Although these paintings in the Brigham have very controversially been removed and redistributed, hospital hallways filled with paintings of white men remain the norm. I want you to now take a couple minutes and think about how have you felt when you've walked into a physical space like that? Have you noticed the art on the walls and the demographic composition of the people featured? Have you felt inspired or curious or maybe a chip on your shoulder? Maybe you felt disengaged or uncomfortable. I think these types of honor walls often cause mixed emotions. What's challenging is that even though I'm sure the men featured in these paintings had all accomplished great things that were worthy of this um, honor, I still often avoided looking at their images. Such portraits have been argued to contribute to unconscious bias, to silently insinuate the false narrative that white men are intrinsically better doctors and leaders without acknowledging the centuries of overt exclusion, discrimination, and bias that continues to limit people of other genders and races from those same opportunities. The lack of diversity in such portraits can serve as repeated reminders to minority medical trainees that maybe we don't belong here, that we are imposters after all. Indeed, female medical trainees and people of color are more likely to report imposter syndrome, mistreatment during training, and disproportionately leave academic medicine. The structural inequalities that serve as barriers for women and minority physicians, the root causes of why we are disproportionately underrepresented in senior leadership, and consequently such portraits, are often insidious and hidden. Nevertheless, art, by its very nature, can shine a spotlight on the previously unnoticed and make visible the invisible. At the end of my first year of medical school, armed with discounted oil paints and a blank canvas my mom picked out at a yard sale, I decided to capture the experience of being initiated into this medical profession, a self-portrait commemorating my white coat ceremony. I completed a series of self-portraits after each year, showing the change from idealization of a career to the gritty, often unthanked, doing of it. 
Through the power of social media, Harvard Medical School's Dean's Office became interested in acquiring my art. When these paintings moved from my bedroom walls to those on campus, however, they became imbued with a new political significance beyond their original diary-like purpose. Despite my newly attained educational and professional privilege, my self-portraits on display swiftly reminded me of how my intersectional identity fit into medical history and this ivory tower. I was now one of very few women, never mind women of color, featured on our medical school's walls. I struggled with that uncomfortable recognition for months. More than ever, I wondered why I, as a lowly medical student at the time, compared to all the women before me, deserved the spotlight. I recalled the jolts of validation I felt the few times I did see a woman or person of color on an honor wall painting on campus. And I trusted that there had to be so many women before me who deserved this formal recognition, but had not yet received it. As a medical student then, I recognized I could not yet fix those deeper issues around the recruitment, retention, or promotion of women and people of color in academic medicine, um, issues that I hope we all will continue to tackle. But I also knew that armed with my paints and canvases, I could channel my imposter syndrome into action and force others to notice what I had so sharply seen, force others to notice who was missing. Nationally, I realized I wasn't the only one recognizing this visual discrepancy. The NIH had just curated an online photo gallery and video archive that celebrates the accomplishments of women in medicine. And Dr. Julie Silver launched the viral Twitter campaign, hashtag walls do talk, to have our academic institutions notice and address the impacts of these all white, all male honor walls. As I looked more into this issue, I quickly saw that Georgetown and Yale had recently redecorated their campuses to feature photographic galleries of female scientists and physicians. I realized I could join a nationwide effort to not censor the inequality of our medical history, but to correct the gaps in the record. I love seeing these new online and photographic galleries and more and more have sprung up over the years but I still want to highlight that there is an important historical and artistic difference between painted portraiture and photography. And I recognize this is a little bit different from the usual lectures that we're used to. So just indulge me for a moment and let me take you on a virtual museum tour to give you some context. Even if you're not an art historian, a quick walk around any local art museum makes it real uh, easy to realize that the tradition to portray people in positions of power in these large oil paintings is centuries old. Compared to the relative accessibility, cost efficiency, and speed of photography, aspects that have importantly democratized art making, oil paintings historically have been commissioned by the wealthy as a status symbol to hang in the home or important institutions as a lasting reminder of someone's legacy. Oil portraiture has always implied a certain level of exclusivity, skill, and time, and portraits were often rich with symbolism. So I wanted to start us off by looking at this portrait of King Henry VIII as painted by Hans Holbein the Younger in the 1500s. Um, this is one of the most famous paintings of a British monarch. He's standing here with his feet apart in an imposing, aggressive stance with his posture, shoulder padding, and gold dagger, purposefully composed to highlight his size and masculinity. 
His necklace and rings were originally decorated with gold leaf and the fine embroidery of his robes and curtains and rugs around him emphasize his extreme opulence. Indeed, this portrait was used as propaganda to reiterate his power and majesty. This, on the other hand, is the famous Lansdowne portrait of George Washington. This massive painting is an impressive 100 inches tall by 60 inches wide and portrays Washington as a larger than life orator. With his ink and quill and books titled Journal of Congress and Constitutional Bylaw by his golden table, he is established as a powerful thinker and democratic leader. It's rarer to see women featured in historical paintings as commissioned portrait subjects, as opposed to anonymous reclining muses. And that's a whole other talk that I won't get into. But honor portraits of women can still emphasize the same wealth and prestige. This portrait of Mary, Queen of Scots, for example, was an engagement present to her future husband and the soon to be King Philip II of Spain, which emphasized her equal political power in this alliance. Uh, though, of course, by placing a flower symbol by her waist, they also reminded the king of her fertility. So perhaps it's a little telling about our own egos in medicine, but on our wall portraits, especially of this large scale, have definitely followed in this tradition and have always carried heavy cultural connotations of power and prestige. Contemporary portrait artists, however, have then used the meta understanding of this historical canon to subvert expectations and refocus our attention towards unexpected subjects or subjects thought to be disenfranchised or powerless. Kehinde Wiley, an artist who paints black subjects into grand classical art tropes, considers this practice a bittersweet dissonance. In this 100 inch by 100 inch portrait, Wiley recreates a familiar 200 year old portrait of Napoleon leading his army across the Alps with a black model that he reportedly hired off the street. Though the subject is still leading a horse into battle with a sword by his side and is still draped in gold, his outfit has been updated to contemporary fashion with army camouflage fatigues, Timberland work boots, and a simple bandana. Rather than the naturalistic background of the original, the repeating ornate pattern in this portrait, especially with a tiny sperm painted in silver, emphasizes and even pokes fun at the pompousness and exaggerated masculinity of the original. Wiley also notably commissioned, uh, was commissioned to paint uh, Barack Obama's official presidential portrait that now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery alongside the earlier Lansdowne portrait of George Washington. Here, Obama sits in a distinguished, relaxed, thoughtful pose, surrounded by symbolic flowers indicating his upbringing in Hawaii and Chicago. Wiley's hyper-realistic style lends his subjects an incredible luminosity and vibrance to their skin, quite literally highlighting how much care he is placing in their representation and beauty. MacArthur genius Titus Cafford's portraits force audiences to reconcile with America's history of slavery and racism. In Behind the Myth of Benevolence, a classic portrait of Thomas Jefferson is recreated and then pulled back to reveal a nude Sally Hemings, one of the enslaved women Jefferson owned and mother of six of his children. This portrait was actually defiled three times while on display in the National Portrait Gallery and ultimately had to be guarded by dedicated security. In Enough About You, Kafour repainted a massive oil painting of Yale University trustees and framed only the enslaved boy who appeared in the background of the original, 
with the rest of the canvas crumpled and hanging off the wall outside the frame. He quite literally reframed the audience's understanding of who is important in this image. As all of these historical and contemporary examples demonstrate, paintings clearly can send a message. The question for medical schools and hospitals then is, what message do we want to send? So a few years ago, in between sub-intern shifts and step two exam preparation, I began working with the Office of Recruitment and Multicultural Affairs, the Center for the History of Medicine in Count Way Library, and the Harvard Medical Alumni Association to connect with multiple living Harvard Medical alumni, starting with a member of our first co-educational class of 1949, Dr. Raquel Cohen, who passed away just one year after I got to interview and paint her. It was an important reminder to me of our living recent history that at the time, the first woman admitted to Harvard Medical School was still alive. Even though I only had the time to interview and paint a handful of women for this project, it was deeply validating to research our alumni databases and realize that in the span of a handful of decades, there were dozens and dozens who deserved to be featured on our walls. Narrowing down the list to a number I could reasonably interview and paint was a challenge in and of itself. These four are women who represent multiple intersections of identity and career paths, who surmounted barrier after barrier in achieving their leadership positions in academic medicine, and who worked tirelessly in helping the vulnerable and voiceless. I wanted to start this journey with them, and I knew I had to use oil paint as my medium of choice to give these women as much visual grandeur as their male colleagues on the walls next to them. Interviewing these women was revelatory. I asked them the same five open-ended questions, hearing them describe their career journey, how their identity has impacted their professional development, both in good or bad ways, how they've already seen the landscape change for women physicians, and of course, any words of wisdom. Despite a diversity of career paths, Many of them highlighted similar moments in their careers of systematic discrimination that also have been described in the literature. Many of them recalled moments, for example, when they had to grapple with societal and personal expectations of motherhood, telling me when I was applying for residency, the director said very clearly, I only have one spot left. Women get married and raise children. Would you pick a male or a female for that spot? And I said, I cannot speak for other people, but I know I will continue working as a surgeon. And even though it was my choice and I would make it again, the balance of trying to be a primary caretaker and trying to do the work I want to do, that's always been tough for me. And you need to be invited to give presentations around the country and around the world. And if you're not in a position where you can travel because you're the main childcare person, that's a structural problem for women or moments big and small when they had been denied opportunities, had to move institutions, or had been passed over for promotion because their work was not taken as seriously as that of a white or male colleague. They told me there were two committees in charge of naming full professors who were all men. I was fiery and I said, look, I raised my voice about why men with a similar amount of research and similar number of publications as me in my field had received tenure while I had not. And I had a paper already accepted for publication, but they had a boys club, you know. So afterwards, the editor sent me a letter saying, on second thought, we don't have room to publish your paper. So I knew I had to leave. And at the time, there were no women who were chairs of university-based departments of ophthalmology. And so it did worry me that my research would not get the attention that it needed, which was exactly what happened. But it could be as little as someone repeating what you just said in a meeting 
and everyone else nodding their heads. That happened to me today. I was like, I just said that. So the old adage about the minority experience, twice as hard for half as much, rang true. Nonetheless, these women also spoke about how their identity formation and hard-earned ability to self-advocate turned into unexpected connections across their marginalized identities. I shared countless affirming moments with them. They proudly recognized their increased awareness and ability to amplify the issues faced by women, Latinx, Black, and immigrant communities, and witnessed relief from their patients when they entered the exam room. They often reference how this experience expanded into a passion for advocating for other disempowered populations with pride. They told me, being a woman of color really allows you to connect with segments of our population who are vulnerable and really need a voice. Instead of having to study or do other things to prove oneself, when I walk into a room, I'm immediately a part of that community. Or knowing what it's like to be from a working class ethnic neighborhood where people don't always have the access to the best resources that they need and want, wanting to really help people in those situations. That's been my whole career. And at every level, federally, nationally, locally, I have always, always included a component of work with Hispanic people because of my cultural background and my capacity for speaking Spanish. I took every opportunity wherever I could to get myself involved. They always needed people. These women all emphasize the importance of having mentors and sponsors believe in you and advocate on your behalf and the power of building up more women in senior leadership positions and in boardrooms to make those calls and make those connections. They discussed how policy changes with things like Title IX and family leave can dramatically change the professional landscape. They all emphasize the importance of taking time to reflect on what you really want and prioritizing self-care. I could not help but feel I had just gained new mentors, women who saw their young selves in me, women whom I could see myself becoming. During my subsequent residency interviews, I answered questions about my five and 20 year plans and found my answers increasing in confidence and ambition as I continued to have conversations with these women. I then came home to reflect on how to paint these pioneers with intentionality and care. Dr. Cohen was my first portrait subject. I was not able to travel to see her in Florida but we spoke on the phone several times and she sent me photos and videos of herself as reference material. I remember feeling so moved by her grace and wisdom and I wanted to pose her in a way that reflected that serene composure. After the first sketches, I then filled in the base color layers, waited for the paint to dry and filled in the shadows of her skin texture, highlights of her white hair, the details of her nails, her necklace, her ring, a process that took me about a month to complete. A good portrait does not solely capture an individual's anatomy. Regardless of realism, good portraits make a statement on personhood, on psychology. In capturing likeness, indeed I was performing a detailed, repeated mental status exam with the subject, appearance, behavior, emotions, thoughts, judgment. I thought about how she kept newspaper clippings from the 1940s with headlines that crewed, Senorita from Peru studies at Harvard to become MD, plans to bring medical care to poor Indian children of her land, and Stork waits as wife wins Harvard degree, and how far she has come. It was an unforgettable experience to be able to interview and paint Dr. Cohen and honor her legacy as a titan in psychiatry before her passing. With Dr. Lee, we also spoke over the phone and she sent me multiple lovely photos, an array of images across her life and career. We debated whether to paint her in her military colonel uniform or in her scrubs, 
in an action shot mid-surgery or posing post-surgery. Most importantly, she wanted to be portrayed as confident, happy, larger than life. She was adamant that I did not paint her waist any skinnier than it truly was. I decided to paint her with her arm resting on her hip, standing with her mask untied, fresh off a case from one of her dozens of global health service trips. As I mixed yellow ochre and cadmium red and reflected on the parts of our conversation that were in Mandarin, I thought about her skin tone compared to my own skin tone, reminding myself of the complex history of colorism that often exacerbates discrimination against those with darker skin tones, even among those of the same race. As I painted the folds of her scrubs, I thought about how she experienced a miscarriage during surgical residency, and instead of making any accommodations, her program director unilaterally decided that a career in surgery was too demanding for her body and dismissed her from the program. I thought about how she then applied once again and fought for a spot as the only woman of a different surgical residency program, and then continued to advocate for decades of aspiring women surgeons after her. I was lucky enough to meet with Dr. Higginbotham in person, and I was able to interview and video record her as we spoke. We discussed matters large and small, ranging from the double standards faced by women and women of color in leadership positions, mentorship within medicine, and then also some lighthearted discussion around her on-point fashion sense. In painting her Tahitian pearl necklace, I carefully considered how we have been socialized to see women's bodies, to minimize their size and age, to emphasize how they dress over how they think and act. I thought about how carefully women must dress to appear professional as a first entry point into having their ideas and authority be taken seriously. I thought about how this pressure and misogynoir is amplified for black and brown women and how women of color ultimately can become stripped of their femininity. I grappled with the Renaissance dichotomy of portraits of scientists and rational thinkers to be facing right, whereas portraits of women and emotion often are favored to be facing left. I wanted to show that Dr. Higginbotham was both of these things an incredibly accomplished research scientist and administrative leader, as well as a compassionate, elegant, feminine person. Each decision of pose and posture could send a message. And at the same time, I cherished each brushstroke of lipstick, of jewelry, these unapologetically feminine things. I was able to video call with Dr. Moreno John back before Zoom became part of our daily lives and was struck by her wide smile and warm personality. In learning her story, I recognize that in a parallel journey with their featured subject, some of these portraits would carry the burden of being the only portraits representing an individual of that race at the medical school. I reflected on how she worked full time for years while taking night classes to save up enough money to go to medical school and how that blossomed into a passion for mentoring other first generation college and medical students like her. I thought about how armed with that firsthand perspective, she co founded a social justice committee and established a food bank within her primary care clinic at UCSF. Despite her altruism and the inherent rewards she and many others find within dedicating yourself to mentorship and service, I still thought about the double-edged sword of the minority tax and not always being recognized for that time and effort in terms of promotions or compensation. For all these portraits, each breaststroke had, be, had to be placed with care. In painting their eyes, their mouths, their wrinkles, their fingers, I tried to capture their resilience, their setbacks, their hard-won confidence. In this labored, layered way, paintings become equally a representation of the artist and her subject, 
a physical manifestation of this reciprocity. In their creation, the subjective can be made objective and the objective subjective. These portraits and their oral histories are now hanging in the student center of Harvard Medical School. And the gallery is very specifically dedicated to the current and future medical students who will study in that space within the student center. There, I hope the paintings will serve as a lasting reminder to future trainees, especially women of color, that they belong. They are not alone. There were women of color before them who paved the way, and there will be women after them following in their footsteps. I hope these portraits will challenge implicit assumptions of what the medical community looks like, what a leader in medicine looks like, and what kind of physician is valued. I hope that viewing the gallery, similar to my experience of painting it, will validate these students' struggles and inspire this future generation to both critique current practices and aim higher. After all, the first step to being seen as a leader is being seen at all. It has already been so rewarding to have current medical students come up to me while they're on their pediatrics rotation and talk about how they've seen the portraits and read the stories. Over the last couple of years, the portrait gallery has truly taken on a life and meaning far beyond what I originally ascribed. As Harvard promotes this gallery to a general audience, though, it raises interesting questions and dilemmas. How can we honor the stories of these women as individuals while still condemning the discrimination they face, even and especially the mistreatment that Harvard as an institution was directly responsible for? or at least complicit in, not too long ago. How can we celebrate these pioneers without tokenizing them or becoming complacent in advocating for lasting change? I knew as the artist that my student project was never meant to be the end point. The logistics of my personal time constraints that only allowed me to paint these four women, of course, did not mean that only four women deserved to be on our walls. And of course, beginning to diversify the artwork on the walls is also just one step in creating an inclusive environment. There's so much work to be done to promote equity for trainees of all backgrounds across not just the visible axes of gender and race, but also across more hidden ones such as sexual orientation, disability, socioeconomic status, and others. As the COVID-19 pandemic deepens existing racial and socioeconomic health disparities, and as our current sociopolitical climate continues to remove and threaten the rights of so many across so many identities, this institutional level interrogation of who is worth celebrating and who is still missing becomes all the more essential. This one gallery is not enough. Over the last couple years, Harvard Medical School's Committee on Artwork and Cultural Representations has continued the work of acquiring stories and artwork to lift up the contributions of other members of our community. On the left is a bust of Professor Alice Hamilton, who was the first woman hired to a faculty position, not just at Harvard Medical School, but at the entire university. When she was appointed in 1919, the New York Tribune wrote the headline, Quote, a woman on Harvard faculty, the last citadel has fallen, the sex has come into its own, end quote. She is quoted as replying, yes, I am the first woman on the Harvard faculty, but not the first one who should have been appointed. Professor Hamilton retired in 1935, unfortunately 10 years before she would have gotten to teach any female students, including Dr. Cohen. Next to her is a picture from the portrait unveiling of Professor William Augustus Hinton. Professor Hinton holds a similar honor of being the first black professor at both the medical school and at the entire university. It's telling that even though he was a member of the American Society for Microbiology, he never attended a society meeting in person. And later on, he even declined an award from the NAACP out of fear that if his race were public knowledge, 
his work would be taken less seriously. Still, during his tenure, he actively broke down ban barriers across both race and gender, teaching at the historically women's only Simmons College and establishing a program specifically for women to train laboratory technicians. And in living history, after I unveiled my own portrait gallery, Dr. Dana Gabuzda, the first female full professor of neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, uh, got a portrait painted of her and I was recently invited to this unveiling. She told me that when she was discussing her portrait posing with the artists, she very purposefully chose her props of an iPad and a face mask to allude to this current pandemic time period. She wanted to make it very clear that these steps toward progress aren't just in our distant past, they're happening achingly slowly right now. I hope you all now can begin to notice and critique the spaces around you and consider how to make these spaces reflect your own values and your own vision. I sincerely hope that this can be a small call to action in this one particular sphere as you continue to do important advocacy work in many other spheres. And I'm so excited that this conference over um, today and tomorrow will catalyze change and I really look forward to seeing the results of that work. Um, and of course, art is not formulaic and a process used by one person for one space might not translate to another. But as many of you are hoping to make the visual environments of your campuses more inclusive, I invite you to reflect on these four following domains of vision, location, audience, and creators. Begin with your vision. What's your institution's history? What's its legacy? And what message do you want to send? None of our schools or hospitals are or were immune to racism and sexism. And we must actively acknowledge and grapple with that fact so that we can take thoughtful, concrete steps in undoing those harms. Whose stories have been erased? Whose do you not want to forget? Once you've dug through your own archives and collected these stories, ask yourself, how does that history match up with what you want your institution's legacy to be? What do you want your institution to be remembered and celebrated for? What's your school's mission? And how can you position both your walls and your actions to inform each other and reflect that message in parallel? When the Yale School of Medicine recently diversified the portraits on their walls, medical students wholeheartedly welcome the change while also worrying that the physical space change might not come along with other necessary institutional reforms. It's important to ground this messaging in honesty and concrete actions. Often I'm asked, well, what should we do about our existing art? Sometimes people who donated previous art pieces may have had certain stipula uh, stipulations for their display or may still be active important stakeholders in your community. How do we not censor our past, but learn from it? There are multiple strategies beyond simply removing these pieces that can invite more discussion and reflection from, from my perspective. Uh, for example, in um, one of the college houses, while a portrait of their alumnus, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, remains hanging in a prominent location to celebrate his undeniable achievements, a recently added portrait of Fred Korematsu, a prominent Japanese American civil rights advocate, reminds passersby of FDR's executive order calling for Japanese American internment. Similarly, the American Museum of Natural History added unobtrusive text commentary onto the glass panel in front of a historical old New York diorama, calling to light the existing diorama's harmful stereotypes, inaccuracies, and controversies through a contemporary lens. Art, especially long-lasting art, requires investment from multiple stakeholders. Of course, you have to think about the people who may be funding this next undertaking in a very literal sense and convincing other leadership that this is a worthwhile financial investment. Uh, perhaps the most important stakeholder, though, is your audience. Consider the various people who might see this gallery on a daily basis, the people who might pass through once in their lifetime on a tour, or others who may visit for academic conferences. In the most abstract sense, 
think about the people who might benefit from seeing this artwork, both now and in the future. Who is your community and who needs to be in your community? Who is this art for? Along those lines, which spaces does your target audience use? Do you want your gallery to be in a high traffic area where people pass through quickly but frequently? Or do you want it to be somewhere where people can stop and look closely? Do you need it to be in a high prestige exclusive area like a dean's office? Or in a more public area like a hallway in front of an auditorium? Should it be a rotating gallery to feature a wide breadth of subjects? Or should it be a permanent installation to reflect a true legacy? Which physical spaces have made you feel like you belonged there? And what made them feel that way? Which spaces need to change? Which spaces are currently blank and might present an underutilized opportunity to send a message? And finally, think about who are your community's creators? Art cannot happen without artists, of course, and art can also reflect the artist's own story and their own intentions, as was definitely the case for me. When all four of these components of vision, audience, location, and artist are aligned with intentionality, the results can be much more impactful and genuine. I'm sure there is much talent residing within your own medical community, or it can be very much worth investing in the time, skills, and vision of local professional artists. Here I wanted to give a shout out to the People's Heart, um, founded by Dr. Daniel Chande, who is a radiology resident at the Massachusetts General Hospital next door to me. Around the same time that I was painting these portraits, he recognized that not only did the walls of our academic spaces need to change, but also our patients facing spaces needed to change. The People's Heart is an amazing hospital community partnership with local artists that now creates rotating art installations reflecting the full diversity of the hospital's patients as well as staff. They've done some groundbreaking work in um, uh, featuring not only a diverse array of subjects, but also a purposefully diverse array of art media, including spray painted mural panels, intricate quilts and embroidery, and mixed media all of which have challenged my own biases about what constitutes quote unquote fine art and what kind of art should be on hospital walls. So I'm certainly not the only one tackling this issue and I continue to be inspired by so many of my colleagues. This is at its heart an imaginative, creative and radical endeavor to envision a place where we all can thrive. So hopefully this conference will catalyze you guys to take action within your own communities, pairing art with many other strategies for curricular reform, inclusive recruitment, retention and promotion strategies, and equitable healthcare overall. For me, at least, I know that painting these women and placing their portraits and biographies on my medical school walls has been cathartic. It has inspired me to be bolder with my own ambitions, knowing that there have been so many others who have paved the way before me. It has increased my conviction that there are countless others whose contributions to medicine have yet to be recognized, who belong alongside the women I painted. I know now viscerally that I'm not alone. One day, 20 or 30 years from now, perhaps someone else will paint me for an honor wall portrait. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak here again today. This project would not have happened without the generosity of these women sharing their time, stories, and likenesses. Um, and I also need to thank um, Harvard Medical School's Dean's Office, Office of Recruitment, Countley Library and Alumni Association, as well as my mentors and sponsors um, and my family who have always supported my ambitions, artistic and beyond. Um, this is my email in case any of you um, have further questions after this talk. And I wrote much of this story um, for this article in Academic Medicine, if you'd also like to take a read of that. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Uh, you truly gave us a, a powerful, powerful session. Um, you blow me away with your talent and you inspire me with your leadership. So many, many thanks. I will invite our participants to use the chat to share any comments or questions. Um, and while we await comments and questions from our participants, 
Um, I'd love to start with your personal portraits, um, Dr. Chen. And one thing that I noticed is, you know, you start with donning your white coat to being in your scrubs and putting your hair back and then the stethoscope around your neck. The, the one where you're putting up your hair strikes me because I wonder about, you know, your struggles with feeling like you had to hide any femininity um, in order to be taken seriously. And the reason I, I ask is because it also reminded me of an article, I don't know if you're aware of it, it's called Afraid of Being Witchy with a Bee, where they mm -hmm. look at female trainees, female residents in code situations. And the women consistently more than the men trainees felt the need to adopt a manly stance. So they felt the need to put their hair back. They even deepened their voice um, and made their voice louder in order to be taken seriously by the code team. So I wonder if you're comfortable sharing, did you struggle with that? Did you feel like you had to suspend any sort of femininity in your journey thus far? Yeah, I, uh, that's such an interesting question. I feel like every time I present these paintings, people will point out different things that they see. And I, I do really want to emphasize that often paintings are like a, a portal to, to think about your own experience and to reflect on your own things. Um, that second year portrait, um, we have um, an accelerated um, uh, preclinical curriculum. So second year, um, I started delving into my surgical clerkship. Um, and that's what was uh, primarily inspired um, that painting. Um, I thought a lot about how, you know, for my white coat ceremony, I got all dolled up and like had makeup on and everything. And then when I'm actually in the hospital waking up for pre rounding at, you know, 5am, no makeup, eye bags, you know, hair is all a mess and is just trying to be as functional and practical as possible. Um, and it's it's so true that, you know, medicine kind of removes that glamour. Um, I, in, in thinking about my specialty selection, you know, um, I gravitated very naturally towards pediatrics and I had to ask myself for a long time, like, is it just because I had so many women faculty um, who were able to dress how they wanted and still act feminine and enjoyed being feminine in the workplace um, that I felt the most comfortable in those environments or was it truly like the, the medicine that I, that I loved? And I do think um, that pediatrics, you know, the subject matter is, is still what um, speaks to me, but I, I had to grapple with that for a while. Thank you so much. Well, the chat is blowing up. Let me share some of um, what people are saying. Inspiring for sure. Great talk. Beautiful. Love, love. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thoroughly enjoyed the presentation of your important work and passion. Um, Dr. Chen, after hearing you at Elam, the whole vision for this conference came together. Thank you. And you inspired a great deal of work um, in this area at SIU, which you'll be hearing about soon. Um, let's see, Dr. Teresa Rohr Kirchgraber, um, who is the immediate past president of AMWA, said in 2019 we did a similar study and found no portraits, pictures, statements with women or people of color on the walls of the medical school. By 2021, we had two portraits of black men and one woman. Now that I'm gone, I hope that the process has continued. Sometimes one has to show the data to get the buy-in. Um, and we have a question, what would your portrait look like now after completing residency? Have you thought about painting another one of yourself? I, I have been thinking about that for a long time and actually it's so crazy that I'm rounding the corner on residency. Um, you guys also might have noticed that there's no MS4 painting. <laughs> um, and part of that was because um, uh, because I was painting all these other portraits um, uh, of these um, alumni, but also because my vision for the end of fourth year was so dramatically different um, than what actually happened with the COVID pandemic that I just was like, I, I don't even know how to paint this. Um, I don't know how to paint um, how I'm feeling. So um, I've, I've had some thoughts. Um, I think 
I, I feel like it's one of those things where depending on the exact month that you <laughs> that you ask me, it would either be like an incredibly frazzled portrait or it would be something with like um, a bit more um, composure, depend, depending on <laughs> my, my hours worked. <laughs> um. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we have a question from Dr. Hingle. Can you imagine other types of art that could create different impacts? Yeah, I think so much of it is um, depending on the space that you're trying to highlight. Um, so I know for the People's Heart, they um, they commissioned like a, um, a essentially a large like street art mural um, at the front of the hospital, and I thought that just looked amazing. Um, so um, that like um, spray paint style of portraiture of um, nurses and doctors um, um, to highlight uh, the frontline workers in the pandemic. I thought that was really, really powerful. Um, I know at BMC, we also had um, a recent like rotating gallery that was actually um, pieces that were designed by um, women in our like addiction recovery program. Um, and so, um, their pieces were on the walls along with like um, small artist statements um, talking about um, their recovery process. So I think, you know, depending on like exactly what space um, you have and um, what what type of message you want to send, there can be so many, so many really, really cool things to, that you can do. Yeah, the, it, I, I love the diversity there. Um... You know, it, it really sounds phenomenal. Um, we have a lot more in the chat. Um, I, I do want to end with a comment from our Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Uh, Wendy Elamin, who said, I have never had the honor of seeing a Black woman physician portrait until this presentation. I've only seen pictures. Thank you. Yeah, and I do think it, it carries a different visual weight right um it it feels much more significant and feels like no i'm i'm really part of this history i'm part of the legacy of this institution um i think it's you know going beyond just having a seat at the table but also having a place on the walls absolutely and i'm i'm so inspired by what dr lee said she said just uh, i want it to be confident happy and larger than life and isn't that aspirational? Isn't mm -hmm. all isn't that all um, that we want to be? Happy, confident, and larger than life. So thank you so much, Dr. Chen. You have given us so much to think about. I really appreciate appreciate your thoughtful presentation and many thanks again for your leadership um, and for bringing your talent and your perspective to our conference. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. All right, well, now we're going to move on to the SIU experience. Um, we're going to talk about an analysis of equity and inclusion in the physical environment in the workspace. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'll introduce our speakers here. Um, Dr. Hinkle, would you like for me to share my screen or were you going to share? Sure, go ahead. Okay. You can do a video. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and share and I'm going to introduce our speakers and panelists. Um, I will start with Dr. Susan Hingle, who is a professor here at SIU School of Medicine, Associate Dean of Human and Organizational Potential um, and Chair of the Department of Medical Humanities. We also have Dr. Wendy Wills Elamine, who is Professor and Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion here at SIU School of Medicine. We have Dr. Hyung Han, Associate Professor and Director of the Postdoctoral Program and the Director of Medical Education Research Fellowship Program in the Department of Medical Education at SIU School of Medicine. And finally, Dr. Harini Ratinamanikam, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine in the Department of Gastroenterology. So we're going to give a brief overview of our work, Dr. Hingle, Dr. Ratinamanikam, and Dr. Han after which we will launch into a panel discussion. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our speakers. All right, thank you. Um, 
We're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this project before I hand it off to Dr. Rathina Manicum. Um, this project um, came, f lots of different things intersected. Um, I had actually heard Dr. Chen speak at ELAM several years ago. She was actually a medical student in the midst of, uh, of her work. Um, and I had been thinking about our environment for quite some time, and she uh, um, really stimulated additional thinking about how to do it in a uh, um, way that was grounded in um, art and science, which I always love when we can combine combine them. At the time, we had uh, received the grant from the AMA um, to really work on trying to increase opportunities for research for our women faculty. And this became part of that. Um, and so it uh, has been very exciting and hopefully not only will we share what we've done, but uh, really the impact that it's had in a very short time. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, I think Dr. Chen alluded to some of the importance of the physical environment. Um, she talked a lot about the um, importance that it creates in creating inclusion and belonging, and it also is an opportunity to advance equity. Um, there are a lot of other reasons to pay attention to the physical work environment. Um, I think that the top picture, it shows um, how many organizations view the physical work environment they view it as an opportunity to really get the most um, productivity out of workers. And um, as you can see, that may not always be the best in creating spaces where people feel like they can bring their full authentic selves to work, um, where they may not feel to, like they're a valued part of the organization, where they feel mainly like they're a cog in the wheel rather than an important individual. And now, um, as we are um, importantly paying more attention to um, the whole self in people that we work with, we do have opportunities with the physical work environment to to increase physical well-being um, as well as emotional and psychological well-being. And um, as Dr. Chen alluded to, when we do that, it does um, really impact inclusion and belonging and does give us an opportunity to advance equity. Um, as we embarked on this project, it started out as women on walls and very quickly became more about equity, much more broadly. Um, I attended the Kinney Brew um, sessions in February, which was really focused on co-liberation. And I left those sessions um, with a, an important, very different uh, um, mindset. Um, I had often um, entered this work with the mindset of helping others. And after those sessions, um, I left really understanding the concept of co-liberation and that when we improve the environment for someone, um, and it wasn't only about the environment, but when we improve something, even if it's directed towards a certain group, we really improve things for everyone. And so it's really with the mindset of co-liberation that we move forward. Next slide. And so what we did was we utilized equity walks as part of a research project to, to identify what our environment was saying about us, what it was saying about our organizational values, what it was saying about our mindset related to inclusion and belonging. And we utilized those equity walks to um, enter into an incredible research project that Dr. Rathina Manicum is going to explain now that used autophotography um, as the foundation. So I will pass things over to Dr. Rathina Manicum. Good morning, everyone. 
um, so uh, I would uh, uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Hyung, Dr. Um, Hingle, Dr. Prakash, Dr. El Amin uh, for uh, being my mentors in this project and uh, also um, for uh, guiding me um, in this uh, with this opportunity. Um, so um, the our uh, research question was to um, analyze or study the physical environment at uh, SIU School of Medicine. Uh, so we used a auto photography and uh, research methodology. Um, so our uh, study was a qualitative research and uh, visual methodologies using photography is a novel approach uh, to qualitative research. Uh, so it gives a rich and multidimensional information as opposed to just uh, solely verbal methods. Auto photography is one such uh, visual methodology. Uh, it was originally used in ethnographic uh, research um, and eventually uh, it was uh, employed in um, conducting uh, mental health research and also in medical uh, research. Um, so, in summary, it is a uh, methodology which uh, provides uh, uh, or serves as a lens uh, for the researcher and the reader uh, to see the world through the participants' eyes uh, by use of photography. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. So, our research question uh, was to uh, study the physical environment um, at SIU School of Medicine. Uh, so, we wanted to uh, study uh, particularly how the physical environment at SIU School of Medicine represented equity and diversity. Um, so, um, we used auto photography in conjunction with group discussions uh, as our methodology. Uh, so, uh, four uh, women faculty, um, I'm sorry, five women faculty uh, from varied uh, backgrounds uh, uh, conducted the research. Uh, each researcher was assigned uh, to take photographs from various sites at SIU SOM. Um, so we obtained uh, 190 photographs uh, from 11 sites uh, in uh, SIU SOM. And um, these photos included photos of pictures on the wall, um, statues, art forms, um, and um, uh, also physical arrangements. Um, once we obtained the pictures, we reflected on these pictures in group discussions. Uh, so we conducted four uh, group uh, virtual discussions. During our first session, uh, we um, uh, did a uh, session on uh, our positionality while conducting research, which was guided by a questionnaire by Richard Milner. Um, so this positionality questionnaire helped us share our racial and cultural awareness um, and um, how we experience the world uh, and how our racial and cultural awareness uh, influences the world uh, we around us uh, and how we experience it and um, how we balance our uh, racial and cultural self uh, um, in society and while conducting research. Following this first session, uh, we conducted uh, three subsequent uh, uh, sessions uh, uh, to discuss the pictures uh, that were obtained. Um, so uh, during these uh, virtual sessions, um, each of us uh, reflected on our uh, emotional and cognitive uh, response to the pictures, um, any perception of bias, and uh, how to fix it. Um, and uh, all these discussions were uh, recorded and transcribed. Um, so uh, we then uh, analyzed uh, uh, the pictures uh, and uh, the discussions which uh, were transcribed. Uh, by using thematic analysis. Thematic analysis is a type of uh, uh, analysis which is used in qualitative research. So we rigorously reviewed the uh, pictures that we obtained and also um, the group discussion transcripts 
and try to identify uh, patterns or themes. Um, then eventually, uh, these themes or patterns that we identified uh, were given names, which is a process called as coding uh, in thematic analysis. Um, and uh, so we identified four uh, major uh, themes, um, and uh, these themes were interconnected, but uh, still represented uh, unique uh, insights. Um, so, um, and uh, we will discuss more about it uh, in the uh, upcoming uh, slides on outcomes. Um, Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we found. So um, in general, the one of the key messages that we found is that wall that we have in our physical environments are meters, actually. So meters are delivering actually some messages and some images and some actually the value. So um, can you click the next slide, please? So what do you mean by uh, messages? One of the messages that we uh, saw on the wall is uh, the walls deliver the value that we uh, care. But what we saw on the wall is uh, actually, Dr. as Dr. Chen mentioned in the earlier session, lots of uh, portrait of the leaders, uh, department of chairs, and also the awards that we received as the institution. And some academics like papers and some po um, uh, posters. So all of them that we saw on the wall in terms of value that we care is really, really excellent. So um, we wonder, okay, so which is great. The excellence is one of the key value that we aspire to have, but what else do we have? Can you, yes, oh, thank you. <laughs> Another message that we saw is that um, uh, the walls delivered who we are. We are the students, faculty, resident, fellow, and staff. So we have all different um, roles in uh, functioning, and but we have seen lots of alumni <laughs> photos, which is great. But we didn't really see lots of students, real um, staff. So that that's another area that we saw. Um, also, walls delivered who, what we do in terms of patient care service research. A learning and teaching service, community service. So those are also on the wall, but sometimes it's some uh, department has some more uh, images about the activities, but some are more scales. Uh, the other message that we saw is uh, who we serve. So walls deliver the, serve the, the communities and patients uh, especially in the clinical environment, uh, the physical building, so you can easily see patient pictures and community photos. But again, it's varied among the departments, and also we saw some lack of diversity there as well. Can you click the next? Yes. So along the way, we have uh, seen some projection of the history where we, we saw the past of the institution. And then some kind of uh, futuristic uh, direction of this institutional value. So you can, we can see some uh, old pictures in a, some older building and then some newer pictures in a newer building. So that kind of progress is also exists in the, on the wall. Can you click? Um, however, there are also some uh, area that we don't really see any messages except a sterile uh, message, which means kind of we, don't, we, didn't, we, we didn't know why those pictures and images are on the wall. So we'll, I will talk about some examples in the next slides. So these are the pictures that we saw uh, in terms of um, some excellence. You know, we saw a lot of uh, portrait uh, of the department chair, and, which is great, um, but as actually as Dr. Chen presented, we have seen the similar message that um, we all uh, we heard this morning in our own institution. Um, uh, the picture on the top right is a hallway in the faculty area, 
where we saw only um, papers and posters presentation. We didn't really see a lot of other faculties uh, figure who devoted this uh, work. So anyway, so how we would present the excellence is a little bit um, limited, I guess, you know, which is the, we, we really uh, value the leadership, but we may have some other value that we can actually convey on the wall. Next slide. So I believe that many of you have seen these pictures Oh, <laughs> really, really well, because those are the pictures in the high traffic area, but we didn't really see know why those pictures were on the wall in the high traffic area, because um, we saw that it's kind of random pictures. You know, we understand that those pictures and art are donated by some um, members of the institution, but there was no storytelling. There is no any description why we actually put this message on the wall. So that's what we mean by sterile. You know, uh, there is no any meaning that we can figure it out. So we can think about um, when we put some message, the pictures or drawing, we might want to consider what message we would like to um, convey. Next slide. So these pictures are uh, some examples that uh, I we would like to really uh, suggest we consider how we present our arts or our visual figures. So the first picture on the top left is the alumni society honors. So you can see one on the left is digital format, which is easily changeable, and then also rotate, actually, uh, where women physician alumni is presented there. But you can see another picture later as because it's rotating. First is the one on the right, which is very, very nice acryl uh, picture where we can learn about all the achievement of the uh, alumni there. But you can see how we present digital format and permanent format. It, it means also something to me, <laughs> so to us, that's one thing. And then on the uh, picture on the right top, uh, there are there are lots of uh, faculty members who devoted to education, but obviously you cannot read their names. Why do we have a big portrait of the chair, but we don't really have any visible recognition of the who devoted to education. Um, even, you know, I I have a good vision, but I couldn't really read it really well. Uh, the picture on the left bottom, there is a piece of paper that we have all the faculty and staff uh, pictures, but they are really, really working hard for patient care and then frontline workers, but their pictures are really, really temporary, and then really, uh, it's a piece of paper, it can easily detach. So that's one thing that I've, we felt that, well, this is also have some misses we, we need to consider. The, the picture on the bottom in the center, you can see Dr. Susan Hingles, uh, interim chairman. We all know that she's not a man, <laughs> she's a woman. Why do we really use chairman rather than chairwoman. So when I see that one, I took a picture. Wow, I had no idea. We just call woman as a chairman. The uh, last picture on the bottom uh, right corner, there is a picture, the several pictures from Memorial Health System, like, the, like month of a uh, colleague of the year, co um, colleague of the month, very, very nice really solid picture, photo in the frame. They're not chairs. They're not really recognized distinguished alumni, but they are recognized as a staff, as a colleague, simply because uh, a lot of uh, really, really um, wonderful work. So that is really, really nice feeling. Next slide, please. Those are some kind of um, heartfelt um, photos that Actually, we discussed the one on the top left is a, a collection of art. 
by the residents in OBGYN. They represent their professional artifact uh, in the art, the painting. And then when I saw this one, you can see all different representation of women um, reproductive art organ, which is really, really nice representation how they perceive their profession and then um, convey that message on the wall for the patient, for the staff, for the colleague. And also the second uh, picture on the top right, we didn't really know what it meant actually first, but later we figured that there is a big heart outside of the window that was toward the, there was for the frontline worker during the pandemic that was created by the, all the internal medicine staff uh, to show their support. Even though we couldn't really see each other, we couldn't really talk in, in person each other, we, they wanted to show their heart and support toward the uh, frontline worker who were, who were really working hard to deal with the pandemic crisis. That was the message that we can see. And it was not really legitimate, it's really kind of hidden, but I really wish that that kind of um, heartfelt message is really explicit and shared with all community members. The last picture that we found was in the uh, one of the newer building uh, in our, our campus. That was uh, very, very different from other uh, older uh, portrait or pictures because it represents the history of the black uh, black history in Springfield, and that was very inspi inspirational and educational, and then kind of uh, help us to identify the community member in Springfield and also as a, a person of color. So that was really really um, a nice feeling that. Oh, wow, we, our institution is embracing and also recognize this historical uh, value and then uh, um, accommodate the kind of inclusion in this wall. This is last slide. So uh, those are pictures from some clinical uh, space. So you can see some like um, very bright smile of the woman and then some kind of uh, a woman playing guitar uh, with the patient in the wheelchair, and then some kids and some adult woman smiling at each other. So you can see some diversity here. Uh, and also I appreciate that kind of uh, some disabled body is also presented on the wall because we usually have an abled body as a norm, but we are in healthcare, we actually, uh, need to think about able body is not the norm too. But the other message that I wanted to say is that I didn't really see any Asian picture in the space. I'm an Asian and I, I just kind of, kind of see that it's a kind of norm, but at the same time, like I felt a little bit um, not really included in this space because simply I don't really see any people who like me. I think that's all that we have as a photo. Can you, um, sorry. So we have more slides. Yes, next slide, please. So uh, there are things to consider. Um, as I said earlier, some photos who are, that are not really, uh, easily recognizable in terms of what message they are going to convey. We need to really rethink about how we would like to utilize the space uh, uh, to represent the, our value, who we are and what we do, who we serve and what we value. Um, we respect the historical progress. So rather than removing all the all the pictures, I, we would like to have a kind of historical progress on the wall so that we can actually learn what, what we did, what we were, and then kind of looking forward to the future direction. That's another one that we can think about. And also storytelling. There are lots of photos and uh, even some award 
that it was not really clear what stories that we would like to convey. So we can actually utilize the wall to uh, convey some storytelling and narrative rather than just kind of um, no uh, story. Uh, another one is egalitarian culture on the wall. We have seen a lot of like excellence on the wall. A word, portrait. Portraits usually convey the power, I think. So, uh, but why don't we have a more inclusive culture to, to invite any uh, member of the community so that they can feel belonging in this physical place? Um, diversity also, I, we believe that diversity should be strategically visible in terms of people of color, gender, ethnicity, and disability. So that kind of um, uh, strategic uh, planning can be helpful. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this is our uh, suggested guideline that when we this make a decision to put anything on the wall, we need to really think about what message we are delivering on this world, what we value, who we are, what we do, and then who we serve. Those are kind of, uh, kind of guidelines that we can think about when we do think about those, and we need to think about diversity and inclusion so that we feel like we are the one, we are the community member. We need to think about past history and the historical progress so that we can actually tell the story to our future generation, how this institution has evolved and then what we learned out of our experience. And then again, last one, sterile. We need to really think about what, why this space is so sterile. Is there any meaning of it? Is this what we want? So, next slide. So um, this is just kind of snapshot of the, some some of the baby steps that we made. So based on our findings, we have been working together with the marketing and some other. Uh, community members that present some other value on the wall. So you can see, you know, champions. It's not really, we have excellence on the wall. Also, we add the value of champions. You can see all different members of the community here. And then you can see someone who, like me, is there too. So that's how, what we have been doing by far. And then I believe that the work is going to continue. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Han, Dr. Hingle, Dr. Radhina Manikan. Um, we're going to go into our panel discussion, which also includes Dr. Hingle, um, who was a part of our original working group. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Um, this has been a tremendous team, and it's really been an honor um, to be a part of this work with you. I'd like to start with your why. Why did you feel this project was important on a personal level? Why did you want to be involved? Dr. Hingle, I will start with you. So I think um, a couple of things. I think one is um, really the opportunity to, to um, really help everyone feel like they belong. Um, you know, the work that I have engaged in with uh, CHOP and with the Department of Medical Humanities now really is part of a vision of creating a thriving world that's full of joy, connection, belonging, and potential. And that is rooted in um, a couple of main areas. One is, um, much of my experience, and I know that my experience as a um, a white woman in medicine um, ha has importance. Um, much of my career, I have not felt like I had belonged, um, and I have had the um, um, I don't know what I've had lots of opportunities, and I have. Uh, um, on the surface had many, many successes. And despite those successes, I very commonly have felt like I don't belong. And it's a, a very lonely experience. And we know that loneliness is uh, um, 
not only a bad feeling, it's bad for our health. We know that people who are lonely uh, um, have more heart disease and strokes and mental health issues, things like that. And so um, one of them is coming from my personal experience of a great deal of loneliness in my career. And then the second is I have a son who is on the autism spectrum and he for his entire life has not been well accepted um, and has been treated incredibly poorly. And um, I have this really, really um, intense desire to make the world a better place for him. Thank you so much, Dr. Hingle. And, and I agree with the loneliness piece. It always helps to have a community behind you um, to get past that loneliness. So thank you for sharing. Dr. Elamin, how about you? What was your why with this project? Well, about five years ago, we did another qualitative <clears throat> study with our students that were part of the Student National Medical Association. And we actually asked them to go around the school and to take pictures of places where they felt belonging or to create art. And there was this one um, picture that one of the students sent in that just, it, it haunts me. It was a beautiful picture but she had taken a picture of herself in the library and the reflection was on the glass. And I was like, wow, this is the place where she saw herself. Is there another mechanism that we can make sure that students um, of color and women see themselves in a different way? So I think that we talk a lot about um, microaggressions, but I really see that what we have on the wall is a form and an opportunity for us to have macro affirmations, uh, an opportunity for us to say uh, you do have that sense of belonging. And some of uh, my work with what's on the wall has been rooted in childhood. And I started thinking of this as I grew up in a household where the pictures did reflect who we were. I had one of those mothers that constantly, if we went to a store and there were not black dolls, or if we went to a place and did not see a representation, that place was receiving a letter. So it has been very rooted in part of my um, advocacy. Uh, but I do think that it's an opportunity for us to collaborate and to look at our facilities and to collaborate with marketing and our public relations, but also to give people an opportunity to say, this is what we want to see on the walls. Thank you, Dr. Elamine. I, I love the macro affirmation term. And I also love what you said about being collaborative, that we're not siloed in this work, that we're collaborating with multiple entities across the organization, and there's power in numbers. Thank you. Dr. Ratina Manikam, can you share your why? Yes, uh, so um, I uh, have been uh, inspired uh, by uh, women leaders and uh, role models uh, and it made me realize that uh, I could be a leader or I could do this and I have the potential to do this. Um, so um, I would like to uh, create a similar uh, physical environment uh, for the future generations, uh, something which can inspire everyone. Uh, so that's why I'm involved in this project. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Ratina Manikam. Dr. Han, how about you? What is your why? Uh, so I have a story to tell. So when I go to, so I'm from South Korea. Mm -hmm. So when I go to Korea, I see lots of um, my uh, own race, like Koreans, right? But at one point, I felt weird to see my own race figure. My view changed because I have some, I have seen some people who are not like me in my physical space in the United States. So my view changed. So, um, but when I think about my uh, actual time in my life, I spend most of the time in the in my office in on the campus before the pandemic, by the way. <laughs> so I come home. And then I spend some time for cooking, some spend time, go to bed, wake up, get to work. So I spend most of time my colleagues and then in the physical building on campus. So when I was surrounded by some um, building and physical artifacts like that, my view are changed. 
that's I think that's what my what I realized. And then I changed a lot. And then when I come to my workplace, I should feel comfortable. I should really feel belonging because that's the majority of time that I will spend. And the physical environment has a power to transform our view and our uh, value very, very gradually, but very powerfully. So, so we didn't re realize how it works, but it, it does that. So that's why I I joined this group because you know we just kind of, kind of treat the wall the wall or artifacts on the wall is just one of those things we don't really really think about it but we need to remember those have a power to change our view so we need to be very kind of attentive and aware aware what message we are delivering to us so that's why. Thank you, Dr. Han. And, and I think you make an important point. We think it's subtle um, and we don't realize how powerful, how impactful it is. And it was through this work that I realized the power of the surroundings. As we start seeing change, we start seeing the transformation as well. So thank you so much for that. You know, my next- hey, Dr. Prakash, can I just add one, one yeah. quick thing um, that I thought of as uh, you both were talking? Um, We started something in internal medicine a while ago called the community closet, which is an opportunity to help support our colleagues when they may, may be having challenges, financial challenges, um, things like that. And people uh, um, will donate things to the closet to, that anyone can, can utilize. And it's stored over um, in the Department of Internal Medicine. And I heard from some of our um, colleagues that they didn't feel comfortable going over there. And when I dove into the why they didn't feel comfortable, it really was related to the physical space. They saw all of the academic portraits and posters and um, it was really um, inhibiting them from accessing something that they could have benefited from. And so that was another piece that I wanted to add in. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Hingle. Um, and, and what a what a valuable perspective um and it, you know how fortunate for the department that they have a leader like you who's listening right that you're not going to take that with a grain of salt that you will heed that um you know and and continue to work to transform the space so that it is more welcoming um my next question really has to do with aha moments during this process were there revelations or things that were never quite on your radar that presented themselves uh, in this work. Um, Dr. Alameen, why don't we start with you? Aha moments. I think one of the pieces that was aha moment for me is that this was a research project. And in that research, we had an opportunity to have a very inclusive group of women. It just, ha it just happened that we were all from different cultures for the most part. And the discussion around it um, and what came up for us personally I think was an aha moment for just how deeply rooted representation was to each person. And then how, when we showed the pictures, we would actually say, well, what do you see in this? Or what do you see in this picture? And everybody saw something so different. So really finding out what people see when they do see things is really important. So when I'm even thinking about our patients and our patient spaces, we need to be asking our patients, what do you see when you see this? Um, and just through this whole process, like I said in the chat, Dr. seeing that woman um, physician, a black woman physician in a portrait was my first time. And I started thinking, when was the only other time I've seen something medically related that was in a portrait? And it was actually with Marion Sims when they had the picture of Betsy and Arca um, in that picture in a, a situation of oppression and pain. And that has been the only other one. So we have a lot of work to do. And that was my aha today that we need to make sure that we are not being a historical telling the history, but also making sure that we are replacing things that need to tell a different story from strength. I like that story from strength. Thank you, Dr. Elamin. Dr. Hingle, how about you? What were some of your aha moments? Um, one aha moment was um, 
coming to the uh, realization that what was represented really only um, represented one value, and that was the value of excellence. Um, and I've often thought uh, um, about how um, how challenging that is because we want people to be motivated to um, to do good things and to to think about how they can do their work the best. Um, but how we define excellence is so narrow and so um, so limited, as Dr. Han showed in her pictures. Um, that I feel that that's something that um, organizationally, that professionally, that societally, we need to really grapple with is how do we really um, keep people motivated um, and how do we recognize all of the great things that people are contributing to, to the work that we do. Um, so that was one aha moment. And then the other was, um, and I think I had always known this, but I felt it on a very profound level, um, how much pain sits inside of all of us um, and how few opportunities there are um, and how few safe spaces there are to, to really um, address that pain with each other. Um, you know, I know people will go to, to counselors and therapists, but that's very different than sharing your pain and your experiences with colleagues. Um, there's something um, just very poignant about that opportunity. So I'd say those two things were my big aha moments were um, trying to figure out how do we celebrate contributions more broadly that represent all of our values, not only the value of excellence, and how do we create more um, opportunities to um, to work through our pain um, together collectively? And I think I, I really like the point you made about safe spaces, Dr. Hingle, is making that standard across an organization where we have safe spaces where people feel okay being vulnerable. We're not given permission to be vulnerable and to bring our authentic self to work. And how do we create an environment where we're allowed to do just that? Thank you so much. Dr. Rathina Manikam, any surprises, any aha moments for you? Um, so uh, for me, uh, uh, one of the things, uh, the uh, one of the aha moments was uh, when, um, uh, I noticed that uh, um, at workplace, uh, I've seen uh, women leaders uh, and also leaders from minority groups, but uh, it was uh, surprising to not see them on the walls. Uh, it, there was a misalignment, uh, so that was uh, something uh, surprising to me. Although we're starting to see an improvement. Um, I, I know Dr. Hingle, uh, her portrait graces the walls of the Department of Internal Medicine now. So we are slowly starting to see some progress. Thank you, Dr. Ratina Manikam. Dr. Ha. Yeah, I agree with all the uh, wonderful reflections here. Uh, one thing to add is that I realized that we all brought our all identities and whole self when that we walk through the physical environment at SIU. So we are, we are on campus in the building uh, as a physician, as a resident, as a fellow, as a faculty, as a student. So we look like professional identity there, but when we actually dissect our feeling, our reflection, what we felt, we actually dis kind of uncover, like disclose a whole identity as a mother, as a person who have an illness, who has gone through some um, very difficult experiences. Uh, so we actually bring whole self to their our environment, and that's not only like easily, um, sh I mean, shareable. But when we see those pictures, we actually bring our whole self and then reflect. So that's what I felt is fascinating. And then that's who we are. We are 
not just doctor. We are not just a student. We are not just a kind of staff. We are just human being. By the way, we are working together to achieve the mission of the school. So that kind of holistic understanding, our existence on campus is very beautiful. That's what I actually really appreciate from our project. Beautiful, thank you, Dr. Han. And it goes back to the question of vulnerability and do we have permission to bring our whole self to this space? Um, and perhaps if we make our surroundings reflective of inclusion, then it does give anybody who's in this space permission to be their whole self um, and all of the identities um, that make up who they are. Thank you. Um, I'd like to shift to highs and lows during the process. Can each of you, um, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing, what were some highs and what were some lows in taking the pictures and reflecting on them? Dr. Hingle, I'll start with you. So I'll start with um, a high, and that is um, really the, the momentum that this project has um, galvanized and um, those last couple of pictures that Dr. Han showed showed a, a, the recent campaign at SIU really trying to have our walls more um, inclusively represent who we are and um, what our values are and we have created a work group around equity in the, the environment that uh, um, feels like everyone who is part of that group um, wants to be there and wants to be part of this transformational change. And so that's been a high is to, to see this work um, that really started out as a research project turn into something that that is really transforming the the environment. So that's a huge high. Um, the low, I think, is what I was saying before is um, just the the degree of pain that exists within us. And I don't imagine that we're um, that different from the rest of the members of our community, of our organization. Um, and uh, um, it's really hard to see people that you care deeply about have so much pain. And so, um, again, I described it as poignant because I think that uh, sometimes these things uh, um, have, a, um, have a different type of beauty to them, but it's still really, really hard. And so that was definitely one of the low points was just the, the recognition of the degree of pain that exists. Thank you, Dr. Hingle. Dr. Elamin, highs and lows. So I think I had a, a, a easier spot to take pictures of, which was in the family medicine department, which is one of the newer buildings. And it was a real high for me to use that as an example of what things should look like because I felt like even the quotes that we had on the wall, there were many by women, even the pictures represented patients with different abilities um, and also showed uh, women having children who were physicians. And, I, and to me, I felt like that was a really big high and being able to see the transformation. One thing we haven't mentioned is those pictures that Dr. Um, Han showed with the champions, those are life-size pictures. And I learned that size matters. There's something when you walk into a building and you're looking at a picture that's the same size as you, it almost feels like the person is there and, and truly palpable. I think that some of the lows for me were just reflecting on my own journey and what people have gone through and how women have in the past not had the same level of permission to express themselves creatively with color and with jewelry and just their their full selves sometimes and i think that um seeing this transformation happen but realizing how much oppression must have been in place for people to feel a sense of belonging i think that that was um hard and then just the intersectionality of being a not 
only a woman, but a black woman, I, it made me think about a story when I was at a previous institution. I didn't see many other black women physicians. And I used to keep this picture in my pocket. And when I saw one of the other black women physicians, when we would see each other, we would just pass it back and forth and put it in our white coat pocket. And it was very representative. And I was just like, just thinking about that story and how we need to make sure that people don't ever need to be in that position and that we have more on the walls. Do, do you mind my asking Dr. Elamine, who was the picture of? Well, I knew you were gonna go there. You're really asking me <laughs> to be vulnerable. But it's interesting when we think about the pictures that we as African-American women saw history-wise, the only pictures they really showed us growing up as children were that we were enslaved. And so at a very young age, I was like, well, I'm going to choose to be Harriet Tubman. And so it was actually a picture of Harriet Tubman and uh, she always said that I have freed, I freed a lot of enslaved people, but I would have freed even more if they knew that they were slaves. And I use that as a way as I've killed a lot of people, but I would have healed even more if they knew that they were sick. And so that was kind of something that I carried with me. Okay. And that was profound vulnerability. So I hope we have friends <laughs> on this. <laughs> Thank you for your vulnerability, Dr. Elamine. That was really powerful. Thank you. Um, I believe Dr. Hingle, you had one more high you wanted to share. Yeah, thank you uh, for obliging me. Um, I just wanted to add um, when I was talking about the momentum that this uh, um, project has galvanized, we did a session at the Kinnebrew um, sessions on this and had participants from, from really across the community and one of the community members that participated was from Memorial um, Health System. And um, the we we did an equity walk through the spaces and the the aha moments that that created in this leader um, and the um, the perceived true interest in really again being part of transformational changes. It's not only at SIU, but we're being able to to spread that more broadly throughout our community. That was another really high point. Mm -hmm. Dr. Prakash, I recently had a very unique experience. I was a visiting professor at University of Virginia and the whole auditorium was named the Penn Auditorium. And mm -hmm. Dr. Vivian Penn was the first African-American woman or actually the, was the first director of the Office of Research for Women's Health. And being able to be in a building that was named after someone had a whole nother level. So I think we also need to look at how buildings are named, how rooms are named, and it shouldn't only be if somebody has a whole lot of money that they get to name the room. <laughs> I just have to add that piece. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Elamine. Dr. Ratina Manikan, highs and lows. Um, one of my highs uh, was uh, uh, the picture that uh, uh, represented the support to the healthcare workers during uh, the COVID times that, that was very heartwarming. Um, the lows, um, it was uh, not being able to see myself on the wall and uh, also not being able to see myself as a leader uh, was a low point. Can I just share, Dr. Rathina Manikam, one of my highs is seeing you evolve as a leader during this process. So I don't know how you see yourself, but you have four women here who see you uh, as an emerging leader. So thank you, Dr. Prakash. Dr. Han, highs and lows. So my high was uh, the moment when I heard from one of the students who actually share uh, their experience when they walk through the dean's lobby and then went up to the library, they saw people like them on the wall. And then they said, that made my day. That was the, how I started the day to prepare the exam, prepare the tutor group. I think that was the education. You know, education is not only creating content or curriculum. What is the curriculum that we can deliver What in terms of what value we would like to share to the learners? That was the very, I was almost in tears to listen to their experience. 
So that little change made their days. Then that's my that's my work done there. So uh, that was the high point. And the low point was that when, at one point we all remember that one point where there was some misunderstanding that one point there were all women's photo on the wall. So we had to clarify that well it's not only for women, it's for everybody. So we started for woman on the wall because therefore there was no woman woman on the wall. That was the starting point, but the underlying core value that we embrace is everybody on the wall. So it's not only removing male figure, removing white people. It's they should be there too. But the core message is all are we we all we value all of our community members. Uh, in terms of roles, in terms of gender, in terms of um, position, in terms of race, everything. So anyway, so that was kind of a little bit lower point, but we had to co correct. And then it's a continuous process. I believe our job is not done here. It's continuous institutional reflective practice in terms of um, legacy, as Dr. Chen mentioned. So. Yeah, it is a process and, and it is a work in progress. Thank you, Dr. Han. In our last couple of minutes, I'd like to go um, around and ask you what gives you hope? Dr. Hingle, I'll start with you. What gives you hope about our process? Goodness, you're starting with me, so I didn't have time to think. Um, I think the, the other four people on this screen and all of the amazing people that I come into to contact with every day. Um, I am actually this week celebrating my 25th anniversary at SIU. And um, when people ask what, uh, why I'm still here after 25 years, I always say two things. One is the mission. And second, which is an equal number one, is the people. And so I would say the people, that's what gives me hope. Thank you, Dr. Hingle. Dr. Alamine, what gives you hope? Um, I want to piggyback on something Dr. Han said. The picture that that student saw on the wall was not just a picture of students. It was a picture of students on their match day, and they had their first choices on that. I took a picture of that and sent it back to the students who are now in residency. And what gives me hope is just how they felt and how they responded, that they were being honored on the walls. And so I... What gives me hope is I do think that there's healing and us being able to show that transformation to people who were previously here as well. Thank you, Dr. Alameen. Dr. Rathina Manikam, what gives you hope? Uh, the fact that uh, uh, someone is looking into the physical environment and uh, as, as a group, uh, someone is doing this uh, gives me uh, hope uh, that uh, someone is actually looking at it and doing the needful uh, to create the transformation. And uh, also uh, the progress uh, that uh, is seen in some of the departments through our work is another thing that is uh, giving me hope that um, um, there will definitely be more progress in the future. Thank you, Dr. Ratina Manikam. Dr. Han, what gives you hope? So, um, so I, like Dr. Hingle said, you know, there is only one reason that I'm here at SIU, um, same reason, mission and people. And also uh, another thing that if I have to uh, add is the institutional, institutional humbleness where our school and then our people, all community members are uh, courageous enough to speak up and then talk about what we can do better. It's very vulnerable time and space that it's really hard to initiate, but we do as a group. And at the time people say, oh, well, looking at the, at the walls, okay, go ahead. But we did it, and then people embraced the value, and then people shared the message that we would like to deliver. So that kind of institutional humbleness and then openness to listen and do work together, I think that's the power 
that I am really, really cherish, and that's a hope. Thank you so much, Dr. Han. And I'd like to thank each one of you um, for being a part of this work. As I said, it's been truly such an honor um, and privilege to be a part of it with you. I told Dr. Cruz this morning that he and you, Dr. Elamine, gave me great hope. Um, but groups like this, leadership like this, um, and the openness, the willingness of our collaborative partners across the organization and our hospital partners to be a part of this work with us, that's what gives me hope. Um, and I do believe that we will continue this incredible work um, and keep moving it forward. So thank you all so much for a really impactful discussion. Um, we are going to take a 15 minute break. Um, please come back by 1015 for a wonderful story slam led by our own Dr. Vidya Sundaration. And if you happen to be on your screen during the break, please um, take a look. Our literary magazine scope is featuring artists from um, across our organization. Um, you will be very impressed um, and inspired by the work of students and faculty um, and staff across our organization. So until 1015, and thank you all for attending.
We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, well, welcome back everybody. Welcome to our much awaited story slam celebrating the experiences and wisdom of international medical graduates. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Vidya Sundaration. Dr. Sundaration is professor of internal medicine and chief of infectious diseases at SIU School of Medicine. She graduated from medical school at Ambedkar Medical College in Karnataka, India. She completed residency in internal medicine at SIU School of Medicine and fellowship in infectious diseases at University of Kentucky. She's been a faculty member with SIU School of Medicine since 2008 and is an advocate and avid supporter of the International Medical Graduate Committees at the American College of Physicians. She's also a regular performer of Indian classical dance and music at various venues in Springfield. She's given multiple lecture demonstrations on Indian classical dance and music for various groups in town. She is mother to two daughters who proudly consider themselves Americans of Indian origin. And she's grateful today to be able to share some highlights from her incredible journey as an international medical graduate. She will be moderating this session along with Dr. Susan Hingle and Dr. Hyang Han, who you previously met. And briefly, our panelists are Dr. Sayeda Hadi who is a PGY2 in internal medicine, Dr. Marcella Rodriguez, associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and member of Pediatric Infectious Diseases faculty here at SIU. She's also clinical director of Pediatric Infectious Diseases Clinical Services. Dr. Hyang Han, um, who I previously introduced, associate professor and director of Educational Informatics, director of the postdoctoral program and director of medical education research fellowship in the Department of Medical Education. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Edam Agama, a hematology oncology professor at SIU School of Medicine, member of Simmons Cancer Institute here, also chairman of the Cancer Committee at Springfield Memorial Hospital and chairman of the Global Health Committee at SIU. Without further ado, Dr. Sundaration, I'm gonna hand it over to you and if you could share your slides and thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash. Uh, and I'm honored uh, to be moderating this session of uh, Story Slam, celebrating the experiences and wisdom of international medical graduates. So in the next hour, through stories, we will discuss experiences of IMGs in the field of medicine and science and talk about inclusive environments for colleagues and um, cultures fostering workplace belonging, as well as recognizing some unconscious biases. And you will be hearing five incredible stories today. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susan Hingle, um, Internal Medicine Specialist, Professor of, Inter uh, of Medicine at SIU School of Medicine. You already heard about her. Uh, she earned her medical degree from Rush College and uh, completing an internal medicine residency at Georgetown University. She joined SIU in 1998. Having grown up in Decatur, she has seen firsthand the positive impact that SIU School of Medicine has had on the region and is extremely proud to be a part of this, that mission. Dr. Hingle is the founding Associate Dean for Human and Organizational Potential, whose mission is to create an environment in which inclusive partnerships 
unleash the individual and organizational potential of our people and communities to learn, thrive, and excel. Dr. Hingle strongly believes that we must focus on equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and as well as clinicians, uh, clinician well-being and fulfillment. If we are going to be able to reach our full potential as individuals, organizations, and as a profession, she's excited to lead CHOP and the Department of Medical Humanities, which will further the vision of a thriving organization and maximize the impact of SIU School of Medicine. On a personal note, Dr. Hingle has been one of my mentors and a champion for many international medical graduates who she uplifts and encourages at all times. I invite Dr. Hingle to introduce this session and explain what a story slam is. Thank you, Dr. Sundareshan. It is such a pleasure to be here. I am so glad that uh, we're doing this story slam and uh, can't wait to, to hear from all of you. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why we're doing a story slam. So storytelling, it's what connects us to our humanity. It's what links us to our past and it provides glimpses into our future. Since humans first walked to earth, they've told stories, even before written word or oral language. Through cave drawings and over fires, humans have told stories as a way to shape our existence. Things happen to us. Those are the elements of a story. And as humans, we have unique perspectives and we need storytellers. And we have uh, five amazing storytellers today. And we need storytellers and stories to emotionally feel what other human beings feel that we haven't in order to live another's pain, joy, heartache, et cetera. This is especially relevant today when hearing from our colleagues who are international medical graduates. We need storytellers to emotionally feel what other human beings have felt that we have felt in order to feel not so alone and to reaffirm our own humanity. This is especially relevant today for our attendees who are also international medical graduates. We need storytellers to see ourselves in a story, to see ourselves as who we'd like to be, to find friends in the characters we'd like to have as friends, we need storytellers and stories as a cautionary tale for what happens when we forget the humanity of others and inflict pain on those we consider different than us. Again, this may be very relevant today when we hear from our colleagues who are international medical graduates. We need stories and storytellers in order to purge. Aristotle spoke of catharsis when an audience would be purged of all of its guilt, shame, fear, etc. by watching or hearing something awful like a Greek tragedy on stage. Will this be relevant today? We need storytellers to teach a history of a culture, to endow morals and principles, to intellectually stimulate, to give meaning to our lives, to inspire, to shape the future and to promote change. A society passes on its values and uses stories to hold up a mirror to nature, as Hamlet said to show us our reflection, however hard it may be to look. It also shows from where we came and to where we're heading. Storytelling is how we make meaning out of the chaos of a human existence. It provides a shape so that we can feel like we've meant something and left our mark on the world. If just one person can tell just one iota of our life story, then we have a narrative and we're the protagonists in our own life story. This is why we create stories, and this is why we need storytellers. They entertain and educate us. They are what make us humans. As humans, we value and celebrate our individuality, yet often forget that there are a million invisible threads that tie us together, and that we're a more, we are more alike than different. International medical graduates play an important role in promoting access to medical care as they're more likely to practice in lower income, rural and urban communities that are underserved by US medical graduates. IMGs make significant contributions to diversity and this diversity improves medical research, medical practice and medical education. I'm really eagerly anticipating hearing our colleagues stories 
and being further enriched by their lived experiences and willingness to share. Good morning, everybody. So um, I am Marcela Rodriguez. I'm one of the um, pediatric infectious disease faculty here at SIU. And I am very happy to be here. Um, thank you for the organizers, Dr. Sundaresh, for inviting me to talk about my journey uh, in medicine in this country. So uh, I grew up in Colombia in uh, South America, and I went to medical school there. Uh, after finishing six years of med school, I went to a rural town to do an internship year. We call it their social uh, obligatory service. We're supposed to do that for a full year before we start practicing medicine. And shortly after starting, about one month later, I was victim of the violence and insecurity of my country. Um, the local physicians for little towns were threatened by the guerrilla at that point to be kidnapped and to take care of their injured members. Uh, so eventually I was forced to quit and leave my country. So back in 2003, um, 20 years ago, I came to the U.S. to find a new future as a foreign medical graduate. I moved initially to Miami, where my brother was living at the time. It took me uh, two years to uh, complete all the requirements to start residency. Uh, this was challenging uh, because I did not have any clinical experience in the U.S., uh, I needed to get a student visa, I need to study for boards, taking some English lessons. Um, I needed to look for institutions that would actually take of service, uh, get letters of recommendation just after working for, you know, a few weeks. But finally, I made into residency here at SIU School of Medicine in 2005. So I matched in pediatric residency here. I was recently married uh, before I moved to Springfield with my husband. Uh, during that summer, uh, and Springfield was completely new for us. Uh, the only U.S. experience that I had was in Miami, which is, you know, has a lot of Latin um, uh, culture there too, uh, and this was brand new for us. Uh, the healthcare system was very different compared to what I was used back at home, and it took me some time for adjustment. Um, at the beginning, I have to admit there was a language barrier. I certainly had learned English back home, but it, this was the first time I had a full-time job uh, practicing in a foreign language. I still remember my first month of residency where I was um, assigned to be at the ward, uh, which is one of the visas rotations for Pitts residents. Um, it was very overwhelming. Um, I was blessed to have a senior resident who at that time uh, was supervising me. She was a great teacher. She was very patient. She was very flexible. She really accommodated to my uh, inexperienced and made my first uh, month way more manageable. So about six months into residency, I really felt more comfortable. Uh, the team in pediatrics was very friendly and always willing to help. Attendings were always open to questions any time of the day, any time at night. I never felt judged uh, when I was asking questions or when I didn't know something. So I successfully finished my three years of residency. Uh, my last year, I was elected chief resident. And then I was always, um, I always uh, wanted to pursue a career in pediatric infectious diseases. That was my dream since I was in med school back in Colombia. And then in my last year of residency, I applied for fellowship. Uh, luckily, I was accepted at Washington University School of Medicine uh, in St. Louis in 2008. So at that time, my husband was uh, between his first and second year of family medicine residency here at SIU. So we decided to move to Edwardsville and we commuted for three years. So I would have to say that that first year of fellowship, I think was the most challenging time of my journey here. Um, my husband was my cheerleader and he always supported me and encouraged me to continue this journey and fulfill my dream of being a PTID doctor. Uh, it was definitely not easy. Uh, WashU was a huge academic, is a huge academic center, and St. Louis Children's Hospital, I would say, is five times bigger compared to my residency hospital. Uh, the patient complexity is astronomically higher. Uh, most of my fellow partners were either graduates from WashU or they were MD-PhDs with a lot of research experience, which I was lacking. 
uh, the volume of fishing was extremely high, and I felt like a miniature fish in that huge ocean. I know that my clinical background coming from a foreign country, what I had to do four out of my six years in the clinical setting was very strong. But in this new and overwhelming and competitive environment, it was very hard to demonstrate I was a good clinician. Um, I was, you know, I was feeling anxious, overwhelmed, always trying very hard to impress other people. For some reason, I, I felt in disadvantage because my fellow from the same year was a WashU graduate and he knew everything there. He knew all the attendings, he knew the residents, he knew every single place in the hospital. I was brand new. Um, I didn't know much of the place. My clinical duties were very demanding. I had to be on service one month at a time and we as fellows, we had to do grand rounds in front of a huge pediatric and adult, uh, very demanding audi audience every every week. So almost every week. So it was it was tough. So something that I'm never gonna remember, gonna forget is my first meeting with my fellowship program director at the time. He asked me if I was working on my English. Um, specifically, he asked me if I had considered taking accent reduction classes. Uh, I was perplexed by his question, and at that time, you know, I was just blocked, and I only answered that I did not have any time to do that with all my fellowship um, responsibilities. So after that conversation, which was basically one month after I started uh, fellowship, I had time to reflect and realize that this comment really affected me, um, and I started questioning myself if I really belonged to that place. Um, I was always trying to prove other people uh, that I could be as good as I were. But then, you know, I continue working hard, even though it was a lot of anxiety and pressure, I, I continued. Uh, and uh, I would say after half of my first fellow, uh, my first year of fellowship, I realized that this was a big and very busy hospital, uh, but that I could handle it very well with all my clinical background. Um, I started to become more confident when I realized that this was not harder than my training back home in Colombia. The patient, the patient complexity was definitely higher, but reading, studying, being compassionate, working hard was everything that I needed to, to be successful there. Um, WashU encouraged uh, trainees to do more basic science research, but I did not feel comfortable doing that because I didn't have any background on that. And I was actually, I was blessed to find a great clinical research mentor. Uh, she accepted me as uh, her fellow in training to work in um, research on methicillin resistant staph aureus. Her research was trans transitional, so um, translational, sorry. So she was, a I was able to spend time in the lab and also in the clinical setting recruiting patients. And with her experience, her teaching, her guidance, my work, I was able to submit my first abstract in, um, which was accepted for an oral presentation in an international platform and an ID meeting. Um, this was very rewarding. Um, subsequently during fellowship and even after we were able to publish several manuscripts uh, reflecting my work uh, during fellowship. So during my second year of fellowship, I gave birth to our first daughter. Uh, being a new mom as a fellow uh, was not easy, but this was my second year. I had a little bit less clinical duties. It was more research dedicated time, so this was definitely a lot easier. Um, then during that year, I was invited to come back for an interview at SIU to consider a faculty position in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, a lot, after a lot of thought, we decided to move here. Uh, we came back to Springfield and I was very welcomed uh, by every faculty member. I joined my previous residency ID attending who was here over, had been here for more than 30 years. I was blessed to have him available every single day, every single time uh, to ask him about questions about all our multiple patients. After my arrival to SIU about five years later, we recruited another ID physician. Our, our team became bigger and stronger. I would, I'm proud to say that our division works as a team always and we support each other no matter how busy we are. All of us three are from very different backgrounds and I could not ask for a better team to work with. I'm definitely blessed to be here. I was awarded Medical Student Preceptor of the Year in 2017 and my division got uh, the Teaching Services of the Year in 2021. I felt that I have made a big difference in this community. Um, 
for my trainees and now I feel like Spain Hill is home for me. Multiple people here have told me that I, they love my accent. I did never take accent reduction classes. So with these, I would end. Uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to take any questions, any comments. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hijab, and I'm a PGY2 in the internal medicine program here at SIU. And I am really excited to be speaking with all of you today uh, about my experience as an IMG. Um, for, uh, for starting, I want to tell you that my experience as an IMG is also um, very closely intertwined with my experience as someone who practices hijab. Hijab means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And every woman who uh, practices hijab might do so for a different reason. For me, hijab has a, a spiritual significance as well as a social significance. Um, more than anything, it is, it is a statement that, you know, hey, this is my lifestyle and this is how I choose to live my life. Um, I started practicing almost seven years ago. And even though it's been, it's been a long time, it does not really change the fact that when you're in a crowd, um, you can feel a little different or you can feel that you're standing out. So my experience as an IMG began when I first landed in New York in 2019 for my observership. And my first moment of cultural shock was when I encountered the subway. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you that it took me an extra three hours to get to Mount Sinai just because I couldn't get on the right train. Um, and my first switch between trains, I actually followed the person in front of me onto a wrong train just because I didn't know where else to go. Um, the second moment, and this was far more disconcerting for me, is when I realized that here in the US, ice cream shakes are milkshakes and milkshakes are smoothies. So <laughs> that was definitely a little uh, disconcerting. But I'm a fast learner, and within a week, I was able to uh, confidently maneuver through subways and sightsee New York and find uh, all the best places to eat. However, um, the hardships of finding you know, the right train or the best halal restaurant to eat in New York seem pretty trivial compared to the experience of uh, matching during the pandemic. Later on, it came to be known as the as the pandemic match. And when you are an IMG, um, you are worried about your chances and you already have a game plan sorted out and all of your steps are already outlined as what you're going to do, how everything's going to work out. Um, but it was all washed away by an itsy bitsy virus that was wreaking havoc all over the world. Um, the policies for application would change every day. There would be new documents that needed to be submitted um, every week and new pathways that needed to be followed just so IMGs could be eligible for the match. Every day I would wake up not knowing if the things are going to work out or not. My step one got delayed multiple times and I couldn't take my step to CS. Um, and I do though fully acknowledge that these changes in policies and um, you know the lack of LORs was very stressful, um, but at that time it was the least of our problems and there were many more serious challenges that everyone was facing all over the world, um, especially in healthcare. Anyway, fast forward to uh, like another year when I received my email that delivered the news that I had matched at SIU and delivered my husband from months of my stress-fueled rants. Um, I was very excited, but a little nervous as well. Nervous about uh, working in a new culture and a new healthcare system, both of which I knew barely anything about at that point. Um, when I, when I came to SIU, uh, it was definitely a very steep learning curve. Um, especially learning all the electronic health records, which we didn't have back in our home country and the flow of work at the hospital. Uh, but that was to be expected uh, given that I was new to the system. What I didn't know and I didn't expect is how welcomed I would feel when I came to SIU. Uh, a very warm, warm welcome by the program, very kind and um, 
helpful seniors. They're very green interns, similar to Dr. Rodriguez. Um, and a culture which promoted curiosity, kindness, patience, and tolerance. And remember when I said earlier that, you know, you could at times feel like you're standing by yourself or standing out. Well, here at SIU, I didn't feel like that. And I didn't feel like I was standing alone. So being a part of this program over the last two years, I've experienced cultures from all over the world coming together and learning from each other. And this is an experience that I greatly cherish and I think I'll remember forever. I have had lots of supports from my colleagues and attendings over the last two years. And everyone, when I started working, was feeling like family very soon. My husband actually joked once that one of the one of the seniors that I frequently worked with as an intern, I had imprinted on and they had become my mama duck. Some of the things that I'm really grateful for is being able to share laughs over small jokes with my colleagues while I'm rounding on 20 patients in the ICU, Starbucks coffee and Krispy Kreme donuts for breakfast that an attending brings at the end of a hectic night shift, frequent reminders that I'm here for you if you need to talk, colleagues feeling guilty for not eating in front of me when I'm fasting or covering for me so I can break my fast on time, covering um, or fixing my headscarf when they notice that it's slipping back over my head, um, everyone being excited to celebrate Eid with us. And all of these things are more have turned SIU a home away from home for me. And we all know how the world has been divided over the last few decades but working together at institutes like this, it gives us all um, the opportunity to bridge that gap, even it might feel like it is on a small scale. <laughs> working with my patients, both at the hospital and in clinic, um, it has given me the opportunity to interact with numerous individuals at a very personal level. And in the midst of you know, such conversations where people are counting on me for making decisions for their health, they also seek my trust. And I always welcome any questions that they have. Um, it gives me a chance to share my culture and represent my people for who they are and explore the similarities between us, explore what makes us um, human and worthy of each other's empathy and kindness. And those few minutes that I spend with my patients in clinic where we get to know each other and familiarize with each other are really important. And I believe they go a long way in bringing all of us together. Thank you. My story is about home. I remember one day when I was a college student at Ihua Women's University in South Korea. My classmates and I had some break time between classes and we went out for lunch at a cafe near the campus. The cafe had a couple of fortune tellers for our customers and we thought, why not? It was included in our lunch bill and we wanted to maximize our benefits. We were so curious about our future regarding when we are going to have a boyfriend. Are we going to have a handsome and nice guys? Um, how about our upcoming exams? We will pass the teacher certification exam. Do we have a, will we have a jobs? How about marriage, etc.? We enjoyed listening to what the fortune teller had to say to us. But at one moment, she told me that I would, I would end up living in a foreign country. It was very odd because I had never been out of the country. I did not have a passport. I planned to be a high school teacher teaching social studies in Korean, my mother language, in my home country. So I thought she was just a fake. 30 years have passed since then, and I found myself living in the United States over, for over 20 years. How, this, how did this journey happen? My ex-husband wanted to earn 
his PhD degree in engineering in the United States, and I followed him. Long story short, I ended up studying here and got offered a, a fantastic job at SIU as a medical educator and researcher. Did I plan to be here? No, I was driven to be here and Springfield became my hometown. My diaspora journey is traced back to my father's journey. Before the Korean War, my father was born in Hwangye-do in North Korea, a northern province of the country. Once the Korean War broke out, his entire family had to flee the oppression of the communists and became refugees during the war. They thought it would be a temporal move, but as we all know, the Korean War has not ended yet. And they have and they have not been able to come back to their hometown. My father's family ended up living in Seoul, South Korea. I know they always miss their hometown and extended family in North Korea. But Seoul, South Korea has become their home for over 70 years. I reflected on my own and my father's journeys to understand home. I was born in South Korea, but I have lived in the United States for the most of my adult life. Whenever I visited Korea, I enjoyed being in my home country. I love the food there, of course, but I have to say, I miss my home all the time in Springfield. Odd, isn't it? When I returned to the United States, my green card reminds me that I am a permanent resident alien. Yes, I am an alien foreigner. I am somewhere between a visitor to Korea and an alien to the United States. I live in this liminal space, and that's my identity. Despite all these complexities, my life and work are deeply rooted in Springfield, Illinois, and the United States. So it became my home. I did not choose Springfield. Springfield just came to me. It is like a relationship with cats. You do not choose the cat. The cat chooses you. So when I heard about people, especially immigrants, uh, xenophobic experiences of being told, go home or go back to where you came from, it hurts. Because my home is here, right here, where I and my loved ones are. Home is a gift that we receive throughout our life journey. We all came from one town, a city, a state, or a country, but our homes are here in Springfield right now. Home is created, strengthened, and st sustained through our community's caring and love, not hatred and exclusion. Let's keep offering the gift to one another. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, Dr. Adam Agama, and then uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sundaration for asking me to be part of this uh, panel. I don't know whether you knew because I had uh, three four powerful ladies in my in my home so you want me to be part of this panel so i may get some little tidbits to take home from this session thank you very much so when i came to the united states from ghana in 1987 i could not fully envision the future that laid ahead of me one thing i knew that as long as i continue to work hard and remain faithful to god things will take care of themselves after my medical school and internship in Ghana, I entered the hematology residency program in uh, 1986. 
At that time, specialist training were completed in the United Kingdom with government support. During the program, I found out that uh, my senior resident was not going to easily finish his training in the UK because the government lacked funds to sponsor him. After researching and talking to several people, I found out that there was a, a graduate school at LSU Medical Center in New Orleans in biometric and genetics. And I shared with my professors and the fact that genetics was included and the fact that I like analysis, you know, they encouraged me to pursue a master's and a PhD program. And I applied and I was accepted. Coming to New Orleans, I had three goals in mind. The first one was to work very hard and excel. And the second one was to join a Christian group to grow my faith in Christ. And, and third one, to maintain a supportive family a relationship uh, you know, when I came to the United States. I felt very privileged because I had financial assistance to pursue education in New Orleans. There were three Ghanaians in the program who assisted me. They were ahead of me, so they knew the landmark and they knew what to do. And they provided guidance and support. I also met very good medical students. There were second year medical students with Christian Medical and Dental Association who guided me and eventually found, helped me to find a, a good church home. At the first year at uh, LSU, it became apparent to me that getting a PhD may not mean what it meant when you are in Ghana. So I had decided to settle on my master's and pursue other opportunities after that. That was what some of my seniors from Ghana did. I was very fortunate after my master's to get a job at the Bugalusa Heart Study. And this is the pediatric analog of the Framingham Heart Study based in New Orleans, but the study site was a, a community in Bugalusa. Dr. Gerald Berenson, the founder of this program and the principal investigator was very reputed to be a very, very difficult person. He was six foot eight inches tall and was very hard to work with. However, after working there for a few months, he liked me to the surprise of everyone. He gave me a lot of work, which I did, and he also gave me the opportunity to analyze big data. Those days, we used the IBM mainframe, and uh, he allowed me to, to analyze the data and write manuscripts. In a short time, I found myself making oral presentations at the American Heart Association meetings. He was very, very encouraging, and he encouraged me to become a cardiologist. But I look at myself and I said, well, I didn't think that I could become a cardiologist because it didn't interest me. And what saved me, despite his persuasion, was that Louisiana State did not allow people from abroad or foreign, foreign medical graduates, as we were called, to get licensure. Eventually, I talked to him and he agreed to encourage me to pursue hematology and oncology training. So, primarily, I, I started applying, taking uh, exams, applying to internal medicine residency program and I got admission at St. Francis Hospital in Evanston, and subsequently a fellowship training at the University of Chicago. During this uh, training, we were very much challenged to push ourselves and work very hard and excel in whatever we did. The hard work was recognized and easily supported and appreciated. I did not face or experience bias, let alone I did not recognize what it was because everybody was, uh, was motivated to work around me. I came to Springfield in 1985 to join the Central Illinois Hematology Oncology Center, or CIHOG. This practice was also very supportive of me. It was a private practice and allowed me to thrive and also to pursue my missionary goals to be a difference maker in Ghana. My first experience of rejection occurred in Springfield. It was from a black patient at St. John's Hospital who doubted that I was a cancer specialist and would not let me see him. I did not take it seriously at that time. And as I grew up in Springfield, uh, a, a colleague told me uh, 15 years ago that I should open my eyes to racism and discrimination and bias because they exist. Recently, again, a white lady who came to see me uh, as a patient confessed that after 20 years of caring for her, she wanted to thank me for being her daughter, her, her doctor. I said, why do you want to thank me? She said she had a confession to make. When I first saw her 20 years ago, she was very uncomfortable for me to be her doctor. But she would not treat me for anybody else. Because when she first saw me, she wondered how come that among all the white doctors in the practice, I, the, she was asked to see the only black doctor there. She didn't like it. She felt uncomfortable. 
but it was very heavy on her heart. And after 20 years, she wanted to confess. And I thank her for her candor. And I told her I didn't even recognize it. But uh, again, recently, just last week, during rounds, I entered a patient's room with a team of resident and, and fellow. And the uh, immediate response from a family member was, are you, the, are you the hospitalist in the room or the resident? And I said, well, I'm not attending. But she stood there in awe. But after a few minutes, she said, well, I like you. I said, well, I mean, I told her you are not alone. You have competition because most people like me. And uh, so we just uh, diluted the, the experience. So all this experience have equipped me to work and interact with various racial groups with no inhibition. I'm able to bring together a diverse group of people, black and white, green and yellow, and pursue medical missions work in Ghana. Since 1996, we've been able to recruit over 480 team members, including doctors, and non-medical people to Ghana to volunteer and serve in the rural area. Our hospital today in Ghana provides medical care to 35,000 patients and through the help of all these volunteers. Interestingly, when we take people to Ghana, a lot of the people in Ghana want to come to the clinic to see the white doctor. And we do not have a name for it now, and, uh, but hopefully maybe one day we might call it exploited bias. So the lessons I've learned is that, one, when you are an individual, you should know who you are and your value in society because everybody in society is very valuable. And two, hard work and excellence are recognized and rewarded in the right setting. And three, there are opportunities that are bound and ready to be pursued each day. Be aware of uh, your surroundings and do not let other people's experience define you and deflate your ambition. And five, you are powerful, you are in a powerful position or superior position compared to most people as a doctor in this country. And six, remember that you may be dealing with someone who has less knowledge or experience than you are, no matter how much they appear to be educated. It helps to be considerate, patient, and understand people's limitations. And finally, we should join a supportive group and seek to get better each day. Thank you very much. We have two international medical graduates in the room. I've been in the US for a long time, and I would like to invite them to share their stories, said Dr. George Abraham, chair of the IMG task force for the American College of Physicians, as I walked into a session with a friend. I held the microphone and began to recount. Like clockwork, we had completed high school, medical school, a compulsory rotatory internship and studied hard to take some extremely competitive post-graduation examinations for medicine and surgery. After we took the examination at the most coveted postgraduate institute of Chandigarh, my medical school sweetheart told me that he was taking the USMLE examination to go to the USA for further training. Why Raj? I don't want to leave India. I really want to go, but you don't need to follow me, he said. After two months of whispering sweet nothings and a large telephone bill for long distance phone calls, I started to look for options to get to the US myself. I had heard that getting a visa to the USA for a female doctor was impossible. I got accepted to do a master's program in public health at Johns Hopkins and decided to come. The line for visa was long at the American Embassy, and I had a large folder of evidence for the officers that I will be able to support myself during my stay for education. My father lost majority of his savings, sending me to the US for this master's program. I carried a large backpack with many mementos of all the memories of home that I could carry with me. At the immigration check post, when I arrived, the officer looked at me. He drew close to me and whispered, so are you carrying all that cash with you? It's for my education, I explained with some anxiety. I have a traveler's check. He smiled and whispered again. Are you carrying any laddus, a popular Indian dessert? 
With a surprised look that the officer asked me something like this, I waved my hand exclaiming, oh, oh no, no, no. Admit it, he stamped on my passport and I set foot in Washington, D.C. to start my post-graduation training. At Hopkins, I met people from all over the world and all over the U.S. Everyone was very welcoming. I learned how to appropriately respond to what's up from my New York classmates, or how's it going? Hola, hey, morning. It was a difficult year with demanding classes, lots of work and new experiences. I got through it and married Raj soon after I graduated. I vividly remember a parting statement from a classmate who worked at the CDC. She said, don't let your degree hang in the toilet. I know that happens to women from India. I came to Springfield to join my husband who had matched at SIU for residency. His new bride silently walked across the local airport in five minutes to get her luggage and waited patiently to be picked up by her husband after his clinic. Raj took me to Subway on the way saying, there is no Indian restaurant here in Springfield. I wanted to scream. I have come here from New Delhi, a very vibrant capital city of India, but that fleeting feeling passed and I was just happy to be with my husband. On September 11, 2001, I reached out to the chair of infectious diseases, who was an IMG herself. From there on, there was no looking back for me as I had found my tribe. My residency and fellowship experience was excellent. My attendings were inclusive. They were kind, thoughtful, patient, and respectful to all IMGs. My class was over 50% IMGs. Our patients were so incredibly kind and nice to me. Many of them inquired enthusiastically about my culture, especially when they heard I was a dancer. One patient told me he expected me to be living alone in a studio as an international doctor. Some of my patients would say, hey, Dr. Sundaration, if they ever send you back to India, I'm going back with you. There were some impressions of me and ideas about me in my patients' minds. I did not think much of it. Recently, I was at the American College of Physicians national meeting where there were many events for international medical graduates, recognizing that IMGs may constitute up to 30 to 40% of the physician or healthcare workforce in some areas. I crossed paths with many international students waiting to get into residency programs in the United States. While at a session with the Pan-Asian Affinity Group, I was asked about microaggressions. Yes, there have been some unpleasant experiences when a patient told me that he did not understand the accent of my people who come to rob everyone of jobs. The patient told me I spoke broken English. On the phone, I often hear Dr. Who when I call back. I have anglicized my name, Vidya Sundaration, to Vidya Sundaration. I get referred to as Dr. Cinderella, Dr. Thunderation, or Dr. Sunshine. And it's okay. I joke about it and respond to anything. One of the international students asked me, will you return to India? It did not take me long to say no. I'm grateful to my home country of India and being Indian is part of my identity, but I also identify with living in the Midwest. SIU and Springfield are my home. My incredible mentors who see me for who I am, my peers, my patients have all helped me complete that identity. As we took the pledge again as fellows of the American College of Physicians, I promised to do my best to pay forward what I have received in abundance and support these young students like I was supported. Thank you. That brings us to the end of Story Slam. And I want to thank all our panelists for sharing their incredible stories and experiences. We have some time for questions.
and I would uh, encourage our attendees to use the raise hand feature if you have any questions or if you would like to share a story of yours. Dr. Sundaration, Dr. Agama, Dr. Han, Dr. Hadi, Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Hingle, thank you so much for a truly inspiring hour. You see the chat is blowing up. Um, with people, you know, feeling very inspired as well. And I appreciate your vulnerability and for bringing your whole selves to this conference. We had touched on that um, as a theme during our panel discussion in the previous session, and I'm feeling that really um, come out during this one. Um, Dr. Adeke has a hand raised. Dr. Adeke, I don't know if you wanna use the chat or Jennifer, if we can unmute them. I have requested unmute. Dr. Adeleke, can you come on? Good morning, off? everyone. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, please, I would like to ask the panelists. Um, I'm an international medical graduate myself, and naturally, I'm an extrovert. I know that right from time. But since I got here, I've been as quiet as quiet can be because of my accent. And um, sometimes I ask myself, how is it going to be in the clinical setting? Because um, naturally, my patients loved me because I went an extra mile. I'm the talker. But since I got here, it's been an issue for me. I've not been able to manage that aspect. I want to ask, how did you cope with people pointing out your accent? You've not said three sentences and someone tells you, I love your accent. And within me, I tell myself, that's a lie. You've just um, made me go quiet again. And uh, people tell me, you, you're not saying anything. I'm like, I don't have anything to say. But really, um, the basis is, I don't want to say something and someone tells me your accent is different because I know it's different, but um, highlighting it makes me kind of uncomfortable and I lose my confidence. So how did you all manage that from being a resident down to being a faculty? How did you manage that? Thank you. Oh, yes, <laughs> so I can share my story. So uh, I, I have an accent, as you all hear, and I, I was told to remove it. So I, that's what I was trying. And at one point, I went to a, a meeting and where there were folks from Australia and UK and Scotland. And then I was real i i i heard someone saying that wow they have a beautiful accent there that i didn't understand at all but they see that that accent is beautiful wow so our understanding of accent is socially constructed which accent is beautiful which accent is not beautiful is a socially constructed so i decide to ignore actually it's not a matter of communication it's a matter of power so since then, um, I am aware that people's recognition of my accent is based on the power dynamics. So I try to be more like, uh, how can I say, kind of recognize the power by dynamic and then I appreciate my own accent. Uh, along the way, I realized some people listen to me despite my accents. And then there are people who are not listening to me because of my accent. It doesn't matter to me. So number one, uh, coping mechanism, being aware that it's not my accent problem, it's a social problem. Number two, appreciate my identity, uh, my talk and my storytelling uh, has my accent. My accent is my part of my storytelling. So I need to cherish and, um, value. So that's what I did. And then by far, um, 
I didn't have any communication issue from my perspective. So that's how, how I handled that. That's a very good question. I think uh, when you look all over the world, you could conclude that everybody has an accent if you take them to a different place where they were not familiar with. For example, a British person who comes to the United States to give a lecture is ridicule for having a British accent. But when you talk about an English language, the British are the connoisseur of English and they read Chaucer and Shakespeare, which we don't read very much these days. One thing that I always tell people is that everybody has an accent. When I take people to Ghana, they have an accent. They don't hear about what they're talking about. And when people call my name, they want to get it right. But the only thing that is right is the way it's written. So for I tell people that for all the effort that you make about pronouncing my name correctly, it is meaningless unless you learn how to write my name. I've known people who cannot write my name because they want to get the accent of my pronunciation of my name very right. And they argue, they debate it, but those are meaningless. So the main thing is that who you are is what is more important than what people think, what you are. Can I just add that um, people can, if if they value it, people can learn to understand anything. They can learn to understand accents. Um, they can learn how to communicate effectively. Um, and thinking about my son who is on the autism spectrum, he doesn't have an accent. Um, it takes him a long time to respond to things because he has a language processing uh, deficiency. And we have learned how to how to communicate effectively with him. And so if people value you and what you bring to the relationship, they will invest time in learning how to to understand your accents. Um, and Dr. Edeleke, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I'd love for you to come back on and let us know how to pronounce your last name. Um, don't change who you are. Um, let your light shine and people will uh, appreciate that. And the ones that don't, they're not worth uh, worrying about. Thank you so much. Um, such such insightful responses. And I, I just want to add uh, my my experience that uh, even now, sometimes I do get conscious uh, when I have a colleague who might be squinting at me or trying to understand what I'm saying. I do get conscious, but I am really learning to put that behind me uh, and uh, you know embrace my identity and my accent is a big part of my identity. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Uh, Dr. Prakash, if we have time, can we take that? Um, this, thank you. So there's a question from uh, Clarissa Williams, uh, Dr. Williams. Um, what gestures of welcome have you experienced in your journey that make you feel most comfortable? Hijab, do you want to start? Um, so for me, um, the I have really not spent so much time here at SIU yet, but over the last two years, um, I feel like um, the big things that I really appreciate is um, food is a really big part of our culture and people, you know, coming forward and celebrating and asking questions like, what's your favorite food? Uh, what do you like to eat? Um, asking about, you know, cooking and then um, basically trying out food from different cultures, you know, my colleagues and my friends. Um, I think that is something that I really appreciate, uh, you know, cooking something for me and bringing it over at work. Um, and then just in general, when they are, when they don't know something, they um, ask, ask, uh, and they're like very um, 
you know, they're very cautious before they speak. They're like, oh, you know, this is something uh, that I want to know about you. This is something that I want to know about your culture. And they're always really nice and kind. And uh, that is something that I really appreciate that they're always, they always ask questions. And I think that is the most important part. And this is, that is how we start uh, knowing each other. So. So uh, for me, I would like to share, um, we have almost every year like a, a Christmas party. And I remember like a department Christmas party. And I remember since I was a resident, um, I always, uh, we love to dance. You know, we dance salsa in my uh, home country. And actually my city is one of the biggest in salsa. So I love to dance with my husband and every single uh, party in December, we, you know, we just, we just ask for a couple of salsa songs and we sing, I mean, and we dance, sorry. And and people really liked it. Uh, you know, I would have people coming afterwards and say, oh, we love how you dance. Uh, even support staff the following week say, oh, we really enjoy that. Um, so, um, so that's something that has made me, you know, feel welcome. Uh, some other people, um, I mean, have called me to help in like Spanish translation production with patients and some people just say, you know, I would love to learn Spanish. I have seen people actually making an effort to to speak Spanish um, or, you know, learn some words from us. And that has, that has you know, uh, made me feel welcome here, too. Um, and there's a comment about uh, the previous question about accent. Um, I always, when I see people um, trying to speak Spanish, I really like it. I like how they make that big effort and I like how they sound uh, and to me it's just like you know like oh my gosh they're so you know they're making this big effort and I, I really appreciate that so I try to feel like people are going to feel that way when they hear when they listen at me so I, I think it just becomes like you with years you will become more confident um, and um, you know it's just always remember is you are one of a kind, like you speak two languages, right? Not just one. Uh, and that's that's very important. Uh, we can communicate, you know, in our home language and in another one, which is which is a is a big thing. So um, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much. Dr. Prakash, I think we are at uh, eleven sixteen. And um, I will hand this over to you and thank you again to our incredible panelists. It's just been such a joy uh, and uh, um, such a great experience for me as well. And thank you, Dr. Prakash, for this opportunity. Thank you again, Dr. Sundaration, and to all of our panelists. Again, I'm touched and inspired. And, you know, as you can see from the chat, our audiences as well. Thank you so much for sharing these important pieces of yourselves. Um, we are going to move on to the last bit of our program today, which is the presentation of our AWIMS awards. Many thanks to Dr. Hingle, who um, took leadership of that committee and did a great job of putting the word out there and getting our group together for a selection of the awards. Um, I am going to hand it over to her. And once our award ceremony is done, please stick around for the raffle, after which we will close. Dr. Hingle, would you like for me to share my slides? Sure, if you could, that would be great. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Or should I say your slides? <laughs> there are slides. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you so much. I am happy to, to really keep this energy and excitement going with our celebration of the SIU AWIMS Award. Next slide. Recognition, I think, is um, one way to help enhance belonging, which we've talked a lot about this morning, as well as to advance careers, as well as to advance goals of equity and an inclusion. And I'm really grateful that AWIMS has this platform to celebrate just some of our champions. So we have the SIU Medicine AWIMS Award for outstanding contributions to the advancement of women in medicine and science. And this is an award that is given annually to an individual of any gender. And you will find out that uh, um, that is a sincere um, part of the award. Um, 
And these are people who exemplify the core tenets of AWIM's mission. And AWIM's missions include promoting positive change in the realm of gender equity, championing professional development and career advancement for women in medicine and science, supporting efforts to improve work-life integration for all members of the medical community, and a commitment and service to our community. Next slide. So we um, want to appreciate and recognize not only the nominees, but also the nominators. Nominators not only call our attention to some of the amazing colleagues that uh, we have amongst us, but they also allow the people who are nominated to see the impact that they are having. Um, and we had 15 people nominated, which is really incredible. Um, it was really challenging to, to work through all of this because there are so many amazing people amongst our community. And you can see the names popping up, the 15 individuals who were nominated. Um, Miriam Agama, Lydia Arbogast, Paige Crawford, Megan Golden, Jean Hansen, Mary Hitt, Catherine Hild Mosley, Hanami Adrizi, Nicole Maroka, Michael Newmeister, Janet Patterson, Robert Robinson, Diana Sarko, Ann Stroink, and we even had a, a team nomination. And these individuals come from many departments. They come from multiple campuses throughout our system. They come from multiple um, parts of our community, from students to faculty to frontline staff. Um, and as you can see, we had a team nomination as well. And I think the, the diversity of who is nominated really is a great testament to, to the impact that uh, um, AWIMS is having on our community. And um, again, it was a challenge, but a really fun challenge. I think the next slide has pictures of the people who were nominated. So you can see some of the bright shining lights that we have amongst us. Um, so the next slide um, basically is a thank you to all of our nominators as well as our nominees for being difference makers. You know, alone, each one of us can make a difference, but together we can make a change. And hopefully this morning you have seen some of that positive change that is happening. Next slide. So um, congratulations to our 2023 SIU Medicine AWIMS Award recipients. We have several recipients this year. Our first recipient is Dr. Catherine Hild Mosley, who comes from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And one of her nominators, um, here's a quote, by expressing true interest and concern about non-work related aspects of life, she makes work a safe place to discuss all aspects of life. By taking time to share and talk with people around her, she improves clinic, staff, and learner morale. So talk about the theme of today's conference, creating an inclusive environment. Dr. Catherine Hild Mosley does just that. Our second recipient is Dr. Nicole Maroka. She is from the Department of Family and Community Medicine. And one of her nominators said that she is someone who is not motivated by awards or external praise but she's getting it today. Instead, she focuses on the work. She isn't out front because she puts other women out front. She doesn't always get credit because she is too busy giving others credit. So again, reflecting on the theme of today's uh, conference, Dr. Maroka is another one who is an outstanding role model in creating those inclusive environments that we're discussing. The next recipient is Dr. Michael Neumeister. He's from the Department of Surgery. And Dr. Neumeister's nominator says, from the first day of my sub-internship, Dr. Neumeister treated me as an equal. I was treated not as the token female surgeon, but simply as a surgeon. It was immediately apparent that the atmosphere was one of respect, dignity, and most important, equality. Again, Dr. Neumeister is being recognized for the inclusive environments that he is able to help to, to nurture as well. 
And our fourth recipient this year is Dr. Robert Robinson from the Department of Internal Medicine. Dr. Robinson's nominator says, in his daily clinical environments, Dr. Robinson has led his teaching team to promote equity and work-life balance for all. He has led and participated in several research projects on algorithmic biases against women, can, which can make a significant impact locally and nationally. And Dr. Robinson recently, part of um, his promotion dossier was a clear demonstration of the impact that he has had on gender equity and his commitment to gender equity. So we also recognize Dr. Robert Robinson as an AWIMS award recipient for his contributions to creating inclusive environments. And on the next slide, you can see pictures of our recipients with their awards. Oh, I think we have a couple more slides. For some reason, it's frozen, Dr. Hingle. Okay, uh, that's okay. As you, uh, as you move along. Okay, okay. So, um, in a, there we go. You can see them with their awards, and uh, again, they are shining lights. This year, we also have the opportunity to present a special award. This will be the second special award that we have given. It's the SIU Founders Award. And this year's recipient is Dr. Christine Todd. Dr. Todd um, is an SIU School of Medicine graduate. She left after completing medical school here and did her residency training in Ohio at Case Western. She then returned to Central Illinois and she served um, the rural community of Mason City, which had very limited access of care. And then Dr. David Stewart was able to uh, successfully recruit her to be part of our SIU faculty um, and SIU family. Our paths uh, have had many similar parallels in our paths. I've been fortunate to have them cross with Dr. Todd on many um, occasions. We both were associate program directors for the internal medicine residency program. Our offices were across the hall from each other. She then, um, being the innovative mind and spirit that she has uh, burning within her, she was uh, the founding director of our hospitalist program, which is now really a, a mainstay in our community. And then she had the opportunity to take the, um, what she calls kind of her dream job. And she became chair of the Department of Medical Humanities, which she led for over a decade and did so with great distinction. With that role, she was able to really focus on um, really combining the art and science of medicine and to really look at uh, um, wellness. And she then became the, the leader of the AWIMS well-being programs, as well as the Center for Human and Organizational Potentials uh, well-being programs. Um, she truly, when I think of her, she is, uh, I couldn't think of someone who better defines being a champion of wellness, equity and inclusion and belonging. And so it was with great pleasure that uh, we recognize Dr. Todd with the AWIMS Founders Award. And with that, we'll say congratulations to all of our recipients, um, gratitude to all of them, Gratitude and congratulations to all of our nominees and gratitude to our nominators. You all uh, um, really are inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hingle and many congrats to Dr. Hild Mosley, Dr. Maroka, Dr. Neumeister um, and Dr. Robinson for the AWIMS award. Dr. Todd, you have been my rock, my source of inspiration um, where you took our AWIMS Wellness Committee and wellness for our organization, um, there are no words, really. Um, and so while I wish you the very best uh, on your retirement, please um, know what a tremendous impact you have had on our organization and on us, um, especially for women leaders. Um, you are truly an inspiration, and I can't thank you enough. 
Um, I invite you and all of our winners, um, if you'd like to say anything, please take the stage. Well, thank you so much, Susan and Vidya and everybody. I am really enjoying this morning. And I just want to say one thing about the founding of AWIMS. Uh, I was at a at a small meeting in internal medicine, and it was suggested that women really needed a support group. Uh, you know, because we're all such messes. We really needed a support group and maybe it could be called uh, a man was suggesting this. Maybe it could be called something like coffee time. And I thought, um, this is a lot more serious than coffee time. Not that I have anything against coffee time. Um, and this morning, I am so impressed. This AOMS has become such a serious thing. It's, uh, it uh, from such humble beginnings has really become something that is um, locked in in our community, growing roots, growing leaves. I'm so proud to have had anything to do with with getting it started. So th thank you so much for recognizing me, and it's been great to be with all of you this morning. Thank you, Dr. Todd. I see Dr. Hild Mosley, Dr. Maroka. I, I would just say thank you so much for this award. It's such an honor to be included in this group of amazing women uh, who are making so many fantastic changes here at SIU. Thank you. I'm truly humbled. I, I just echo that. Um, it means a lot to be a part of, you know, just even who's on uh, the panel today and listening uh, to your great works. So I'm honored. Uh, it means a lot. Thank you. Thank you both and to, to all of our award winners for your inspiring leadership. Many, many congratulations. All right, well, I promised we would have a raffle. Um, I'm going to ask Jennifer um, Coyle to go ahead and randomly select two individuals um, for any one of these books. We have two from Sudha Murthy, 3000 Stitches and Here, There and Everywhere a special book, Women on the Walls, and a wonderful book by Dr. Karen Nichols on physician leadership. Um, and so, Jennifer or Laura, can you draw a name, please? David Akers. David Akers, congratulations. If you can um, privately uh, message either Jennifer Coyle or Laura Worrell on which of these books you would like, we will uh, send it your way. And who's our next winner of the raffle? Laura, do you want to draw? Sure. June Agama. June Agama, many congratulations. Many congratulations. Um, so I, I would like to end, um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I would like to end um, with this quote from the former US Secretary of Labor. And I apologize, I should have uh, kept sharing that. So it's from Alexis Herman and it goes as follows. Inclusion and fairness in the workplace is not simply the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And I want you to really reflect on everything that you have heard today and really reflect on the impactful discussions, um, the, the heartfelt dialogue, and really consider why all of this is not simply the right thing to do. Why is it the smart thing to do as we move into um, part two of our session tomorrow? Um, so again, I'm grateful to all of you uh, for joining us today. Grateful to our conference planning committee, to Dr. El Amin, our Associate uh, Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Please enjoy the rest of your day until tomorrow. Much gratitude.